a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put them in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. It's started already. Good morning. It's just gone <laughs> 6 o'clock on Tuesday the 26th of March. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Sanctions over the Chinese hack. Two individuals and one business are named over that 2021 data breach. The Deputy Prime Minister yesterday saying we must defend our precious democracy. But critics say the government's actions do not go far enough. A step towards peace. The USA abstains as a UN resolution on a ceasefire in Gaza finally passes. It comes as Benjamin Netanyahu cancels meetings between Israel and the US. And online banking fraud warning today, my friends. Over 2,000 suspected fake websites were reported last year. Our consumer expert shares his advice to keep you and your finances safe this hour. And sunshine for some today, but for most places, it's looking cloudy with rain or showers. I have the full details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The government is today being criticised for not going far enough to combat the cyber threat posed by China. Two people and a company have now been sanctioned over potential attacks, which the Chinese embassy in the UK says is completely unfounded. Well, several MPs say the government's not holding China to account and that the response is insufficient given the severity of the situation. It comes after the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden accused the nation of being behind an attempt to access the details of politicians as well as 40 million voters. A number of our international partners, including the United States, will be issuing similar statements to expose this activity and to hold China to account for the ongoing patterns of hostile activity targeting our collective democracies. Mr Speaker, you and parliamentary security have already been briefed on this activity. Next, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It marks a significant shift in the position of the United States on the issue after the country decided not to veto the measure. It's the first time the organization as a whole has called for an end to the fighting since the war began in October. The mother of a footballer who was stabbed and killed in a nightclub in Birmingham is calling for new laws to force venues to use metal detectors and stock bleed kits. Cody Fisher died at the Crane nightclub on Boxing Day in 2022 after a large knife was smuggled inside. Well, Tracy Fisher said the venue had blood on its hands after prosecutors questioned security. In the United States, officers have raided the homes of rapper Sean Diddy Combs in Los Angeles and Miami. The Department of Homeland Security said it carried out the searches as part of an ongoing investigation by federal agents in three separate locations. Several recent lawsuits have accused the musician of sexual misconduct. And a man in Australia has finally been freed after getting trapped for 36 hours in a drain. He first entered the underground network in Brisbane on Saturday while trying to retrieve his phone. However, emergency services had to be called after he spent hours wading through stormwater to try to find an exit. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. So all I can think about is Mike, our little uh, our floor manager here, being stuck in a drain for 36 <laughs> hours. That would only happen to... All right, Marky? <laughs> All right, Mike, good. <laughs> nice of you to join us again, though, Mike. Yeah, it must sir. have been a difficult few days underground. <laughs> yeah, you've stuck your head above the parapet. Well done. Oh. Uh, welcome to Tuesday morning, where the debate this morning... No, don't go, Emily Rose Adams. Don't even wave at her very Sorry. quickly. <laughs> I'm 60 next year, and you've taken great delight in humiliating me. She said, and I quote, because I'm not really looking forward to this, this is what she said. She mm -hmm. went... 
when it all starts to go downhill a bit. <laughs> shit, <doesn't> it? <laughs> Look, I've spoken to many six-year-olds and they all say it's the best decade because things start slowing down. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah. Honestly, you are and so... And you've just had a newborn you're baby. You're so fired, Emily. Is that <laughs> you really are. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Right, you can get in touch with us all morning as ever. You can mm. email us talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet at talktv and you can text talk plus your message to 8722. Lots to discuss this morning. Our top story is on those Chinese cyber attacks. We've asked, are you worried about interference in the general election? It's very interesting, isn't it? Lots of, I mean, they said yesterday, didn't they, Nick? 40 million of us had our electoral data, uh, you know, harvested, for want of a better phrase, mm -hmm. uh, three years ago. Oliver Dowden is not the greatest public speaker, if I have to be honest. It sounds like his mummy just let him out for about 10 minutes. He was talking about it in Parliament. Quite interesting. A lot of people saying they didn't go far enough. SNP Stuart MacDonald, I love this, said, and I quote, like turning up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon. So could we or should we do more? Should we be worried? Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. It is our top story. Yesterday, two people and a company sanctioned over Chinese cyber attacks on the United Kingdom. As you heard in a speech yesterday, Deputy PM Oliver Dowden said that Beijing was behind the attacks on the voting registry and on a number of MPs. Well, we're joined now by Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and former Labour advisor, Mike Buckley. Good morning, both. Morning, gang. Morning. Morning. Alicia, you? can you just give us a bit of background to this story? What's transpired over the past 48 hours? Yes, yeah, so this was a cyber attack that happened in 2021, but only emerged a bit um, towards the end of last year. And they have now worked out that it was from a, a Chinese company. Two individuals have now been sanctioned as a result of this, and that was Oliver Dowden's, you know, big measure to try and clap down on China. But really, it didn't go down too well. Lots of people were just saying that, really, is that going to do anything? Is it going to stop it from happening again? The chances are probably not. But the trouble is, is the UK have a big issue when it comes to China. Our relationship with China has worsened over the past decade. And the worry is that if it deteriorates too much, what happens then? I mean, right. are China a, a malicious state? Are they not? That's what the UK needs to kind of work out. Mike, it's quite interesting, actually. We were talking yesterday about TikTok and the, the, the uh, assumption, obviously, that's Chinese-based and information. And it is a very real threat. I know they're discussing it in America, though. Robert Jenrick, who I suspect, without being cynical, is thinking about <clears throat> the future, said yesterday, the government is clearly not holding China to account for their attack on our democracy. Taking three years, which is the point I was going to make, to sanction just two individuals and a small company is derisory. The feeble response will only embolden China to continue its aggression towards the UK. Thoughts, yeah. Mike Buckley? I mean, for once in my life, I'm going to say it's quite hard to disagree with Robert Jenrick, and I'm not <laughs> sure that's ever happened before. Uh, but he's quite right. How has it taken them three years? And how is a, a reasonable response to put sanctions on two people? I mean, you're entirely right when you say that we need to be careful about maintaining a working relationship with China. We want to influence over Xinjiang and the, you know, the horrific things they're doing there. We want to make sure they don't invade Taiwan. We need to collaborate with them on energy, on global security, on climate change. But that doesn't mean that we give them carte blanche to invade our democracy. I mean, one thing that you haven't mentioned this morning, I was hearing yesterday, apparently they've been targeting local government officials for years and trying to infiltrate and trying to work out who might be friendly towards them on the assumption that these people might in the future go on to become MPs so they can have people in positions of power. This has been a systematic attack on our democracy. Alicia, is it really that big a deal? Um, this is for, I, I understand 40 million voters' uh, data was compromised, but a lot of that information you can get publicly anyway on the electoral register. It's available to view online. It's what has actually been done with this data, or what's the fear about what will be done with this data, and how is that a threat to our national security? I think the thing that takes away the kind of blanket sweeping data gathering element of it is that they also access data of specific MPs who were critical of China. So any MPs who've come forward and been vocally critical maybe said that we need to label China. China as an actual threat, they've targeted their information as well. So that kind of makes you think that there is something specific happening okay. there that's wanted that, that they've wanted to gather certain people's information for the sake of maybe using it against us or maybe using it just for their own intelligence about things that are happening in the UK. Mikey, I get, I've been accused um, of, you know, talking up the fact that the, the, the world, in my opinion, is, is, is in quite a precarious state and there is an axis of China and Russia and Iran that I think we should be aware of, both militarily and in terms of this. I understand what you said when you said, you know, we need to make sure we try and hold them to response. You're not going to hold China. I, I, I mean, I, I think this is quite worrying, and I think we should be more robust, and I think it's not scaremongering. I think people need to wise up to the fact that infiltration is happening. And we now have 
So much of our infrastructure is technology-based, right? It is. And they have ripped out a lot of Huawei Chinese um, tech from major pieces of UK infrastructure. I think it's including, including security infrastructure, and that's a good thing. But that only happened relatively recently. But you're right, China is not on our side. No. One, of the, one of the main reasons that the Russian economy is doing so well, despite Russian sanctions over Ukraine, is that China's still buying loads of their oil, it's buying their gas, it's buying their stuff, it's helping the Russians maintain their economy, which is, which is effectively helping them be at war with Ukraine, which, negates, which is effectively you know, war with the rest of, of us. You know this, oh, if we stand up, China will be held to account. You make a perfectly mm. relevant point. Those sanctions have done jack, really, to uh, avoid... To, to be honest, they're, they're trading between each other. I do think it's something that we need to consider. That's, that's all is. I'm saying. But is the UK not doing this to China at the same time? Are we spying on them? I have no idea. I mean, how would I know? I yeah. don't know. You would presume so, but I presume that we're not engaging in the kind of and tactics this, that they are. Is this not on our security services to improve our cybersecurity? Yes, but I think the general consensus globally is that China are always a few steps ahead, and mm. I don't think anyone really has ever caught up with that. And it's always just the working presumption that, oh, yes, they are. They always just do know more about us than we'll ever know. And I feel like there's never really an attempt globally to try and shift that narrative just because of how much power they have. Interesting. I mean, I, I just think it's... Uh, I mean, I, I wasn't going to read this out, but I'm going to, which will cause Lucy in the, in the back to fall off. Ian Duncan Smith described the UK's response as like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. <laughs> I'd just like to throw that out there. I, we were trying in our meeting to work out what the hell that meant. But, I mean, is I... It, I it, an is it a Chinese <laughs> proverb? And he's, <laughs> in, and he's in the governing party, but if he's not impressed with his government, I mean, why should the rest well, of the... Let, well, let, yeah. let's give you carte blanche now, Michael. Um, uh, Tory MP Scott Benton has decided to quit Parliament almost after a year of being embroiled in a lobbying sting. And can I just say, genuinely, right... I don't care what political party you're from. Yet another goddamn example about why your average person would look at MPs and go, you're becoming a joke, mate. I know, I mean, exactly. This is, I mean, in a way, this is about a party and he's going to stand down and he is a Conservative MP. It is worth saying that. But he's also just a twit. I mean, let's face yeah. it. I mean, allegedly, maybe I need to throw that in word no, in there. No, I listen, but, I wouldn't but, use the I yeah, word. Well, exactly. I mean, he has been approached by somebody saying, oh, give us some information, we'll give you some money. And instead of saying no, that's clearly against the law, he said yes, which is why he's standing down. So he's doing it now. In theory, he could and normally would have waited until the end of his recall petition. So he voters in his constituency, if 10% of them sign the petition, he has to resign. Yep, yep. He's gone before that concluded. People think so that the by-election can take place on the local election day, which will prevent Labour pouring in activists from across the country into you know, the, his seat on the day to run an election campaign. So it helps the Conservatives a little bit, makes it slightly more likely that they will retain the seat. In reality, they've got zero chance of retaining the seat and it's going to go Labour. How, what do you think, Alicia? What's yeah, it going to no, look like no, for... Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that's why it's like for contribution for the morning. That's it. Absolutely. It's good. Yeah. It's, it's I, think it's, I think it's going to be very interesting. And look, to, to just stake my personal claim to this, my, I'm Blackpool North. My family are Blackpool North. Mm. Um, You're and from I know, North, aren't you? I'm from the North. north. I'm from the North of the North. Uh, and this is the Blackpool South constituency. And it's it's been really upsetting, actually, to see. You know, we hear all these sleaze scandals, but it always feels a little bit, I don't know, at an arm's length. Whereas when it's a constituency yep. that I care so much about and to hear that somebody was, you know, doing what he did. I don't even have to say allegedly it was caught on camera. Mm. It's absolutely awful. And I think it's, it's really it's... let down the people of Blackpool Sound. But, I mean, I think that's the point. And I do think the one issue about this next election will be... And apathy is not the word. I think the British public have woken up, like I said it might the other yeah. day. Actually, we don't want tax cuts because we may have to pay it back, right? All these things. I think British people have been taken for granted by politicians of all parties. Mm. I will say in 2019, I think the Labour Party's big mistake in the North in those rebel seats is they assumed the working man and woman would vote, and they didn't. And I think that politicians of all parties need to look in the mirror because I think people are becoming less and less connected to politicians. Just a quick reaction. Do you know what I, I mean? I think people want politicians that are going to do something meaningful that's going to impact their lives. They haven't seen that for a long time. People are disillusioned, mm. actually. And you look at the polling, and I think I mean, it seems all but certain Labour will win the election. You look at the staggering gap between their vote and uh, the Conservative vote. But you don't get this sense of excitement. No. I think, and that, I don't think that's even particularly a judgment on the Labour Party. I think that's a judgment on we've had enough of bad politicians and bad politics. You need to persuade us now that you really are going to do something that's going to change my life and make things better. Completely well, agree. Thank, thank you, you both gang. for joining us. I believe Alicia will be back with us later well, on in the show. Listen, I'll have well. more to say than yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would help. Yeah, that'd be great. Go and study. That'd thank be good, you, yeah. Alicia Fitzgerald. I'm Mike Buckley, former Thanks, Labour Mike. advisor. Well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. It is our top story today in the Times. 
Times, Britain and the USA accuse China of launching a prolific global campaign of cyber attacks. China will now be declared as a national security threat. The Telegraph revealing changes, by the way, speeding motorists, TV license offenders and truants are treated in court, with magistrates calling for a judicial overhaul. And brave Kate saves lives, say The Sun, as the Princess of Wales is praised for inspiring hundreds of thousands to get checked for cancer. Good honour. Well, to the Middle East now, and Israel has cancelled planned talks in Washington after its biggest ally abstained from a ceasefire vote at the United Nations Security Council. The United States has a veto, which is previously used to block three ceasefire resolutions. Let's speak to Yoram Kafino from Jewish News UK, as well as the former Defence Minister, Sir Gerald Howarth. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Yotam, let's start with you. Um... They've abstained, the United States. Can we get a bit more detail on this? Um, is that just posturing or is that where we're at? Are they still providing arms? What's the situation, my friend? No, they're absolutely still providing arms. They're still supporting Israel. But, of course, this, this marks a change in their diplomatic uh, handling of the situation. The fact that they're abstaining means that the Security Council resolution now passed. And that's why Israel, or at least Netanyahu, the prime minister, is so uh, angry with this. And the U.S. still did criticize the resolution. The fact that they didn't vote yes was because the resolution does not condemn Hamas and it also doesn't uh, call on Hamas to lay down its arms. But it did abstain because it wants to see a ceasefire. Now, the reaction from Prime Minister Netanyahu is very childish and he is creating an artificial issue between the U.S. and Israel by, first of all, uh, cancelling a delegation's visit to, to Washington, but also simply attacking the United States for abstaining. It, it's very, um, I wouldn't say unusual of Netanyahu, but it's something that doesn't serve the interest of Israel when he does that. Just bring in Sir Gerald Howarth. And, <clears throat> Sir Gerald, lovely to have you on. Um, the thing from my point of view, and, and, and everybody has an opinion, is that... You know, we've talked incessantly about the horrors of October the 7th. We've talked about the humanitarian crisis. We've talked about how globally the situation and the, I think, reaction has changed. But Netanyahu seems to be, in, 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 in a period of time, uh, becoming a, a person not on his own, but he's becoming increasingly isolated. And many people that I've spoken to, Jewish people from England, who would be appalled by what's going on, are also saying... This man is not only responsible in, in terms of being in Israel for what happened, but is only in power because, essentially, without the war, he's gone. Do you think this is likely to, to be more about Netanyahu going forward? Because I would have thought yesterday was quite seismic, unless I'm missing the point. Well, Jeremy, I agree entirely with your analysis, and I agree uh, with what Jojo has just said about uh, Netanyahu behaving uh, in a childish fashion. And I'm sure you're right that if there were peace and if this war had not taken place, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu would no longer be prime minister. So he has, uh, as one might say, some skin in this dreadful game. I also think that uh, the conflict which took place, and let us not forget that it is Hamas who are responsible uh, for what is going on in Gaza, the appalling loss of life there. Hamas are responsible. Their brutal murder of 1,200 Israeli citizens just enjoying themselves and going about their ordinary lives is utterly, utterly despicable and unforgivable, and Israel is entirely right to go after them. However, what we are seeing on our screens does not look like uh, precision bombing. It looks like saturation bombing. And Israel has a lot of precision weapons. So I do not understand why this war is being prosecuted in this way. And I also believe that the objective which the Israeli government has set itself, the elimination of Hamas, was always going to be unattainable. You cannot wipe out Hamas. And by inflicting this, uh, uh, this, this uh, um, conflict upon the Gazan people, the Palestinians there, all you're doing is actually acting as a recruiting sergeant for Hamas. I think it's really up to the Arab world. The Arab world needs to take a much stronger stance against Hamas. They have allowed Hamas to build up their power, to build all these tunnels, often with money provided by other Arab countries. Uh, they need to take control of this and make sure that Hamas does not re-emerge. Uh, so, Gerald, to what extent do you think that... Um... 
protests and public calls for a ceasefire have impacted this kind of decision making. Um, not necessarily UK protests, but <coughs> protests in the US. It's obvious that US representatives are feeling the pressure of the public, the majority of whom want to see an eventual peace. Well, I think they're 100% of us, uh, not 100% of us, but 90% of us want to see an eventual peace. Uh, I don't think the protests have had the slightest influence on the British government. Uh, I cannot speak for the United States government. I do not think they've had any influence here. I think, if anything, they have uh, uh, upset a lot of British people. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, I just do not go to London. And my friends and I do not want to go to London on, on a Saturday. Our capital city has been taken over. And it's very notable that all those protesting about what is going on in Gaza. Again, the responsibility of Hamas, not the responsibility of the Israeli government. They're not people who've been out on the streets protesting at the brutality of uh, President Putin, uh, the way that he has uh, destroyed civilian enclaves in uh, But Sir Gerald, with respect, Ukraine. we're not providing arms to Russia, are we? And we don't, well, we did have a resettlement agreement with the Ukrainians, something that has not been offered for Palestinian people. Yes, we do have a resettlement arrangement for uh, for the uh, U U Ukrainian people, and that's right, right and proper. We have an agreement uh, with uh, Ukraine, uh, and as does Russia. It is the Budapest Memorandum of 1995, signed by Boris Yeltsin on behalf of uh, Russia, by Bill Clinton on behalf of the United States, and by John Major on behalf of the United Kingdom. No Germany, no France. It was just us, and under that arrangement, in return for giving out the and time to uh, weapons are so, uh, Ukraine's independence and uh, 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 an obligation there, which uh, does not apply in, in, in the case of, of Gaza. Um, so, Joe, so, just a uh, sec, because your, your line, equated. my friend, is just jumping out. If I can just see if we can check that. If we went to Joe a minute. I, I, just a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, interestingly, you said at the end that that resolution yesterday did not include the condemnation of Hamas. But I just want to make a wider comment, and I'd, I'd like everybody's reaction. I get absolutely what Sir Gerald said about October the 7th, and we'll sit here forever and say that's fine, right and proper. I absolutely understand globally people will look at those pictures and go, this needs to be sorted. But to me, whoever jumps up and down, whether there's resolutions, whether there's marches, the truth is that a ceasefire is only going to happen if the two component parts of that war want a ceasefire. And maybe I'm missing the point, my friends, but I'm not convinced that Hamas or Israel want a ceasefire right now. Not at all. Well, Hamas have agreed, I believe, but Israel not to these particular terms. Is that correct, Yotam? First of all, yes. Uh, what's interesting is that what Israel could get from this resolution is far better than what they're currently negotiating with Hamas in Qatar. The deal that's on the table, which Hamas, by the way, dismissed this morning, was a ceasefire, a six-week ceasefire with the exchange of 40 uh, hostages and seven to 800 Palestinian prisoners, 100 of whom were convicted of murder. That deal is horrific compared to what the ceasefire actually calls for. The ceasefire says simply uh, a truce until the Ramadan is over, the release of all hostages. It doesn't talk about the release of any Palestinian criminals or murderers. So the ceasefire is far better for Israel. And still, Prime Minister Netanyahu is choosing to lash out at the United States, to call this ridiculous, basically, and to not support it. And Hamas, of course, is much smarter. Hamas is welcoming this and saying, well, this is a great uh, resolution, although they will never abide by it. But at least they come off as much more rational, which so is we have, insane. We have essentially a war where people are losing their lives with politicians and countries posturing. Yeah. What does that say? That's... Can I just... Sorry, Nick, do you want to do that? Just what love Sir Gerald's reaction to that news just in. Hamas leader, how do you say that? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, a mass leader has travelled to Tehran for meetings with Iranian officials, we've just heard down the line. Well, very interesting, very interesting, Jeremy, because uh, it's very important that people understand that all these uh, these organisations, Hezbollah, Hamas uh, and the Houthis, uh, they are all beneficiaries of funding from Iran. Iran is the, uh, the evil player in, in all of this. Uh, they have spent their time funding these... Um, 
uh, these uh, terrorist groups uh, who have been acting as proxies for them, uh, destabilizing the whole of the Middle East. Uh, they really are uh, uh, an outrageous country. And what a shame that such you know, lovely people as so many uh, uh, of the Persians are led by uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, of madmen who are, are inflicting this damage and indeed provoking it. So it'd be very interesting to see what they're telling Hamas, but I doubt they're telling Hamas, oh, please lay down your arms and, uh, uh, and please uh, uh, arrange for a, a ceasefire to take place uh, in, in Gaza. I do not believe that Iran will be doing that. And I should imagine as well, for the families of the hostages, that'd be very, very upsetting to hear that there has been <clears throat> certainly an offer on the table and it's been rejected. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yotam Confino from Jewish News and former Defence Minister Gerald Howarth. Thank you both. Still to come on Talk Today, farmers descend on Parliament to protest over food production. And there's tougher rules for football fans ahead of the Euros. Now, the man on Sunday is Anna... The high liver. And entrepreneur Will Hodson. Take us through this morning's papers next, 6.25. A very good morning to you. And I've got a story for you next about Tom Cruise. Coming right back. Oh. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You were told today at 6.28, Nicola Thorpe. Yes, it is indeed. Uh, we'll have the weather and a mini-mo gym jam, but here's what else is coming up. That's what, do you want to hear the Tom Cruise thing now or later? Later. Uh, oh, right. They're playing okay. the music and it'll run out eventually. Oh, right. Right, right. Uh, 1,600 cocaine-taking football fans... Who counted them? ..will, will be barred from the Euros as banning orders reach a 12-year high. That's in the papers next.
Right, more than 2,000 suspected copycat banking websites who counted them were reported in 2023 alone. We'll find out how you can spot the signs of a dupe just before 7 o'clock. And as Labour drew up a set of 15 questions for the Prime Minister at today's Liaison Committee right, meeting, them. we'll hear from Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth at 7.20. But first, let's take a look at the weather with Naz. Morning, Naz. What can Good we expect? Morning. <laughs> Am I allowed morning. to say in this world? Apparently, I'm, I think that is beautifully look lovely today. Of course, you're allowed Thank to say that. Thank you. That's very kind of you. You're not going to say the same about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There Snow's on go. the way. <laughs> the ice queen cometh, my friends. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. She's so good. She's so good. She's frozen in time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the weather. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Once again, it is looking pretty unsettled out there for today. There will be a bit of brightness here and there, but on the whole, we've got low pressure firmly in charge. That means we are going to continue to see unsettled conditions of rain, showers, some of them heavy and thundery, brisk winds from midweek, and uh, even a little bit of winteriness here and there across parts of the north where cold air sits. As we head into the Easter weekend, though, the winds do become lighter and there will be more in the way of brightness. In fact, it will feel fairly mild in any sunshine, but there will still be the risk of some wet weather. And speaking of wet weather, this morning we've got rain already across parts of the south and east of Ireland and Northern Ireland, up towards the northeast of England and eastern parts of Scotland. Some wintry showers across the Aberdeenshire area, but otherwise it's mostly dry elsewhere. But not for long, we're seeing rain creep up northwards across central and southern parts of England and Wales. For Scotland this afternoon, plenty of sunshine, but cold air still sits there, so a chilly day with wintry showers in the east. Northern Ireland, there will be cloudy skies, some patchy rain likely. And England and Wales will see that rain up from the south moving its way northwards up towards eastern parts of Wales, the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England through this afternoon. So a rather wet one out there. Temperature-wise, we're looking at highs of around 12 degrees Celsius, uh, best in any brightness down towards parts of the southwest. And for Scotland, it stays cold despite the sunshine there. Now, overnight, that rain continues its journey further northwards up towards parts of northern England and northern Ireland southern Scotland as it hits the cold air there there's likely to be some hill snow across parts of the highlands and eastern Scotland as well. Further south we'll see yet more wet weather spreading into the southwest so it's going to be another wet one for tomorrow not everywhere but as you can see that rain across the southwest will steadily move its way north and eastward so a bright start for many central and eastern areas but then it will become wetter from the west windier as well. So for Scotland the mid-afternoon picture is that of rain across the north wintry showers there and further rain across southern areas quite a cloudy day in comparison to today. Lots of sunshine for Northern Ireland on the other hand but there will be showers and plenty of showers across England and Wales in between bright or sunny spells. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. I've been waiting for this. Thank you, Naz. Time to go through this morning's papers with the Mail on Sundays, Anna Mihalova and an entrepreneur, Will Hudson. But before we start, Anna, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I don't want to give away too many details, but on Friday afternoon, you partook of a rather nice time with champagne with a good friend of ours, and it was women only. Was it a women only club? Because I've heard nothing about the Garrick being slagged off all week. Well, I wasn't invited. Is it women only, Anna? It is not women only, Jeremy. You're welcome <laughs> any time. <laughs> there you see, loose there. Brilliant, thank you. Well, how are you, Will? Very well, but I wasn't invited either. Jeremy, so it's sexist, there we go. isn't it? Well, come on. Well, well, I'm off... expecting resignations from the assembly. <laughs> <Yeah. very laughs> oh, good man. After the Garrick, both of you. Anna, yes. um, we've been talking about this story all morning. The front page of the Daily Mail. Um, Fury at feeble rebuke to China. That's right. So um, MPs last night hugely criticised the government's feeble, what they called feeble response um, uh, to a, what is evidently a rising and growing t uh, threat from China. Yeah. Um, this is all down to there's been a coordinated action between the security services of the United States and, and, and the UK. Um, but the United States seems to have gone much further, actually sanctioning uh, people and even uh, being taken to court. Whereas we have sanctioned two individuals and one small company, which, you know, MPs are saying that that's pathetic. That's that's nowhere near enough. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert in any of this, and we want to get through this, but I, I would never agree with the SNP. But Stuart Macdonald said, and I quote, it's a bit like turning up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon, Will Hodson. This has taken three years. It's a pathetic response, man. Yeah. 
Well, I, I went to boarding school uh, and I know what damage you can do with a wooden spoon. <laughs> But I... It depends. No, I'm not even saying that. I also but, but... went to boarding school, and it depends what end. <laughs> but but the... my no, for being hit with. Yes. The so... spatula end's more painful. So we have found your area of expertise. Yeah. Not... <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Finally yes. well after six months. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll get my yeah, bachelor out but, yeah, but later. Any number of MPs, not just from the SNP, but also, you know, former people who are part of the government, like Robert Jenrick, yeah. are lining up to criticise the response. It's not enough. Do you agree? I do agree. I yeah. do agree. We, we do risk a slight repeat of what happened with Russia in 2014, where, again, the United States were a lot further with sanctions. Yeah. We were quite slow off the mark. Interesting. Mm. Right, front page of The Guardian now, Will. Um, Israel isolated after UN Security Council demands Gaza ceasefire. That's right. So plenty of discussion about this already. So, uh, you know, the, the headline is you've got the technicalities you just set out. But really, we're seeing an era-defining crack in the relationship between Israel and the US. The US has acted for so long as effectively you know, <clears throat> Israel's diplomatic protection on this matter. And they've had a bet that they could influence Netanyahu's policy as a result. They can't. Uh, and Israel has effectively called the US's bluff. Yeah. And the US is now saying, we are not bluffing. They have abstained from this vote. That means all other 14 members have backed it. And uh, there is now a call for a ceasefire. At the risk, and I don't want to get into the debate about ceasefire or no ceasefire, but, but, but with, re with respect, Anna, give me your response to this. Well, you talk about bluff, Will. They've mm. abstained, right? They've abstained because apparently they don't like one or two things about it, something to do with mass. But they're still sending weapons. So who's, so who's playing the game? Are you telling me that the United Nations is that important still, that if they abstain in a vote... I mean, you call it era-changing. Is it they're still sending weapons? I don't get that. I think Netanyahu's under pressure. And I, the only thing I can see from this is that the Israeli people might throw him out of office, which would change everything. That's what I think. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, you raised multiple very good points. Um, is the UN effective? It's not certainly not as effective as it used to be and as it hopes to be. Um, and the, but, but equally, sending weapons while also doing something on a diplomatic field. But that's nothing new. It's real no. politique, you know. <clears throat> look at history. It's, it's um, happened time again. Do you think we'd be in the same position in this situation if Netanyahu was out of, of power? We would see a different policy, but the question is, you're so far down the down the yeah. line now. Yeah. And yeah. realistically, I don't think he is coming out of power. And, no. Not right with the walls on. Yeah. Time soon. Mm -hmm. uh, right, Anna, moving on now to a story in The Times all about farmers and protest. Yes, um, it is in The Times. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is obviously everywhere. There was a huge protest outside Parliament um, with uh, tractors um, uh, driving down, uh, about 150 tractors, and... Um, they are protesting the unfairness, what they say, of government environmental rules that uh, dictate how much, essentially encourage them to take out um, fertile land and use for woodland and use for uh, rewilding and that sort of thing. Um, it is in the Times, as I say, but the best write-up is certainly in the Telegraph, which is very colourful, and it says that, um, well, th one point is... Uh, the farmers turned up hoping to bring London to a standstill like, like uh, they did in Paris, but hadn't realised that London traffic is so bad <laughs> that essentially <laughs> no-one noticed the difference because it moves at a leisurely farm, farmland pace. I'm, I'm sort of... I, I, and I'm not being... not laughing, but I, I sort of have a great deal of sympathy for the British farming community, and I think that we we need to do more as a country to support the production of our own food for all sorts of reasons without getting political. I have a great degree of sympathy well, for well, the, Food for security the... goes beyond the interests of farmers, right? In, in theory, especially as, as the weather changes diplomatically, yeah. internationally, <clears throat> the only food you can count on producing is food under your own control. So I have some sympathy. And uh, an interesting point for The Telegraph to chew on is a lot of this boils down to post-Brexit rules and being exposed to the opportunity of global trade in food, which has maybe not worked out as well as a large Brexit constituency had expected. A couple of comments, actually, Nick. Tractor protests, we are. Should the government do more to protect British farmers? Paul, it's not a question of protecting them. It's a question of leaving them alone and stop making their lives unnecessarily difficult. Henry, yes, without food and our own farmers, the UK is in a very vulnerable uh, position to starvation. Imagine if the UK did not have farmers back uh, 30, 40 years ago. Interesting yeah. point. Yeah, do very, very interesting indeed. The community in the, the rural areas needs to be talked and about. And like that. you say, you know, the more homegrown food we can yeah. do, the better for us, the better for the environment, better for the economy.
etc. Did they do 20 miles an hour or did the dealers <laughs> charge them? That's what I'm thinking, looking at the pictures online. I mean, you can imagine. I take your point, though, because you can't go fast enough to... to, yeah. to well, perhaps they should have glued themselves to the pavement <laughs> instead. No, they've got jobs. Will, uh, <clears throat> moving on now to the front page of The Telegraph, yeah. uh, secret courts for speeding and TV <laughs> fines must end. Yeah, so, so this is a profoundly Kafka-esque process um, and it has been left in the hands of Britain's magistrates. And it's Britain's magistrates who have put together a huge complaint saying this cannot go on. Now, where did it come from? Ministry of Justice. What, what is this process? It's effectively a streamlined process, in their view, to help people deal with minor offences without having to suffer the ordeal of court. But these magistrates are having to deal with issues with no more than 90 seconds per case. With 90 nine, seconds? 90 seconds. If, to deal with someone's wow. uh, experience of justice in <clears throat> 90 seconds, you don't need magistrates. You need the So Solid crew. <laughs> but there's, there's no time at all. It's ridiculous. And as a result, you're getting what looks very much to the Telegraph, who are all over this, hideous miscarriages of justice. A 78-year-old with dementia fined for not having car insurance when she was in a care home. A 33-year-old handed an £800 legal bill after accidentally failing to pay £4 to the DVLA. And an 85-year-old woman who had not paid car insurance because she had suffered a broken neck been sent to a care home. What is wrong with this country, guys? Seriously, what is wrong? Well, well, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're just sitting around and you're thinking... I don't, a, police, a, a policeman or woman won't come if I get burgled, and we're putting a person with dementia, a £500 fine. What is wrong with our, 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 our social... The, is this the, just because the justice system, system yeah, is, is under pressure? Overloaded. Overloaded and underfunded. It, it's, it's overloaded. So I'm going to be... I'm going to take be the devil's advocate here mm -hmm. and say the problem is not the process. The problem is the outcomes. Sure. Yeah. You know, with 90 seconds, you can see any one of these things shouldn't have happened. Box yeah. ticking, right? The problem is that it did, yes. Well, and the other bizarre thing is uh, this measure is suddenly coming about. It includes TV licence fee offences, so the, the argument is, well, you make the system a bit better by making it more transparent. But Boris Johnson fought an election, and I remember this because he made the pledge when I was on the bus with him, um, saying that he's going to stop the criminalisation of uh, licence fee non-payment. So where's that? Yeah. Where's Boris Johnson? Well, but you do, look at, the bus you do look at the bigger picture, don't you? You think these people are being prosecuted in 90 seconds it's to tick a box and awful. move on, and yet our criminal justice system does not allow to, to, to put people away who have done some heinous things. It seems to be a, a really, really bad Just. image. I love this next story, Anna. I think it's after all the trauma, and I'm not going back into, you know, who says what, but uh, uh, front page of the mirror... Princess Catherine, by being that candidate, has triggered a massive surge in web cancer checks, which can only be a good thing for everybody. Absolutely. Um, and hopefully will <clears throat> obviously lead to early diagnosis, yeah. people getting treatment. Um, now, so the, the NHS uh, page on cancer was visited more than five times its usual amount, uh, which, of course, is extraordinary. And hopefully she is reading that and feeling that, uh, you know, g g the stress she has gone through um, will, will, will uh, seek to help other people. Exactly. Like the Jade Goody effect, I think they so call that it yesterday, as well. I mean, Jade Goody, the c cervical right. cancer smears exactly. went through the roof Absolutely. after myself that brave girl. Yeah, myself included. I, you know, caught something very early, which was great. But I can't help but feel a tinge of sadness about this story, actually, because, as we know, NHS waiting times at the moment are absolutely abysmal. Are we actually going to have lots of people, um, you know, sadly rejected potentially by a service or having to wait so long that they mm. might not even be able to get treatment. But Potentially, but it's still positive if people it, start oh, the course. hunt early. And also, as a lot of people say, with, with the NHS, um, there are many, many problems with it, but the people I know who've gone through actual cancer treatment, often they do get fast Within a two weeks. Well, that's the, that's the goal, isn't it? It's supposed to be you're seen within two weeks. I just, yeah, it just makes me really sad to think that, you I, know, I, unless I... you have access to private healthcare, a lot of people will know that they've mm. got something looming and not be able to get the help that they need. I agree, although I will say, in the defence of the, the NHS, having <clears throat> gone through that myself 12 years ago, um, when they know, and they do know very quickly, trust me, yeah. they respond incredibly quickly. And I said I this to a good friend some time ago who was terrified about his wife. And I said, what do they say? And they said, we'll, we'll get back to you in three weeks. And you can confidently <laughs> say, yes, she hasn't got cancer. 
and he was in bits, but it's right. The NHS, yes, is stretched, but in those moments does a it fantastic really shines job. Through. And the good thing is, is the people are more aware, which is great. Dave shouting oh, on my so end. So important. He's shouting again, Dave, in the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna yeah. and Will. They will be back in just under an hour. Now, we talk a lot about ULEZ uh. and traffic rules in big cities on this programme, but today... We're not doing that. That's because taxi drivers in the New Forest are worried about going out of business because of the local council's new eco rules. We've sent the intrepid legendary talk TV correspondent Nicholas Ellaby to investigate. Good morning, Nicholas. Where are you? These donkeys aren't the only thing upsetting drivers in the New Forest at the moment. Small taxi firms in Ringwood are worried clean air rule changes planned by the council could see them being run off the road completely. If this rule comes in, what does that mean for you and your business? Well, I think it would be the end of it. It really would. Just not cost effective. Phillips lived in Ringwood all his life, but picked a London cab because it was purpose built and could take disabled passengers. But the new eco rules would put him out of business. I don't think that a few taxis running around the New Forest are going to make a great deal of difference to the, the environment. New Forest District Council's plan would mean taxis would have to be less than five years old when registered and from January 2026, drivers won't be able to renew a licence for a taxi that's more than 10 years old unless it's fully electric. Nicole has several customers who rely on her service, but it would cost the company £400,000 to upgrade. We're going to have to reduce our taxis, which means less people are going to be able to get in and out. Obviously, we've got a disabled vehicle and they uh, rely on us quite a lot to get, to get them from A to B uh, to appointments and not many people are able to do that. It means prioritising the environment will come at a cost to locals with disabilities who most rely on the service. To actually lose another opportunity to get out and, uh, and miss out on your independence, yeah, it it's, it's can only be a bad thing. Local councillors say the changes are to improve air quality and all responses to the plans will be carefully considered. But with rules on new clean air schemes being ironed out right across the country, taxi drivers and passengers here are hoping the council just gets out of the way on this one. Nick Ellaby, Talk TV in the New Forest. Nice. Uh, thanks, Nick. Still to come, consumer king Adrian Mills is with us this morning. Legend, what have you got coming up? I like the word legend. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, we'll be looking at the rise of banking copycat websites and making sure you and your money stay protected from the scammers. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back, my friends. You would talk today. It's approaching 10 to 7. Now, a study by consumer giant Witch found that in 2023 alone, 2,000, yes, 2,000 suspected fraudulent copycat banking websites were reported and consequently added to an increasing blocked list. Now, with potentially millions of consumers being left exposed to the risks of fraud, the government giant is calling on the next government to place a duty on domain registrars to prevent scammers from setting up fraudulent websites. Well, we're delighted to be joined now by consumer expert Adrian Mills, finally someone who knows yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Good morning, Adrian. How worrying is this report? Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg because uh, this uh, block list that was discovered by um, a company called DNS uh, Research Foundation in conjunction with which, who are the consumer champions, mm -hmm. found, as you so rightly say, 2,000 scam sites that have been taken down. Now, those are the ones that were found. Yeah. You may well find that some of the banks have got, they've used the name in in a slightly different way and therefore they almost look legitimate and therefore they haven't been taken down there's a very good site called scam advisor that scam advisor. scam advisor it's open to the public you can go on there you can look at everything from internet dating right through to banking scams the problem there that they discovered there was also 2,000 fake websites and it's every single bank imaginable and the worst two and I've said this for years Barclays and Santander. For some reason, the scammers love Santander. They will go after them. Somebody and... was telling me about an M that's written differently. Oh, no, no, this, this is... We fell foul of this. We lost £3,000 as a business and we never got it back from Barclays. Um, we have a restaurant, as you well know. We were asked to send some money as a rental payment, £3,000. Off it went. Lo and behold, when we looked at the website, we went, oh, my God, no. All the legitimate names didn't have .com at the end of them. It was .corn, C-O-R-N. But the R almost goes into the N, making wow. it look like com. That was the only way we discovered, and the bank discovered, that it was a con site. The annoying thing there is Barclays then said, you have to talk to Monza, where the money went to. Monza said, you have to talk to Barclays. It took eight weeks, £3,000 out of our account, we got £20 back because the scammers sometimes set up these sites for, say, a day, a week, a month. As soon as they've skimmed all the money, they're out, they're away. And Where are they based, these scammers? All over the world? All over the world, and in particular this lot, because I'm a consumer investigative journalist, I found this group in an industrial site in the East End. The banks, the police, no one was interested. So I went down there myself. Stop. Pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, got to the actual address, yeah. knocked in the door, couldn't see anything, looked through their sort of little letterbox, and there on the floor were just dozens of letters and, you know, with, and there was a box with complaints written on. Um, and they'd gone, they'd gone. And nobody knows where they've gone. And the banks really, really... I mean, they keep saying they care, but I'm not sure they do. The most Why they... would they not care, though, banks? Does um, that not take business from well, them? Well, no, because what they, what they will say is um, you have to show more due diligence. Right. But as things progress and we go into the era of AI, then obviously, at the moment, if you look at a website, you know, if, if there's a banking website, you look at it and it might be out of alignment, there might be a spelling mistake, a dot sure. over the I might be somewhere else, and you think, that is real rubbish. English, yeah? With AI, they will run that through and it will come out perfect English. I mean, you know, you look at those sites there, you'd be thinking... Are both of these fake or are they both real? I can't... Uh, well, that's for you to decide, oh, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. And that's, Which one's fake, and, Dave? And that's the problem. Right, the one on the left, Nick, is fake. Stop. 
Yeah, Why? but you wouldn't know. Now, we're sat here, relatively intelligent people, I would like to think. I'd like to say relatively, One of us. Yeah. And, and, you might, wow. and you might be in a situation where you're trying to pass money on to somebody mm -hmm. third party very quickly, mm -hmm. or you've been told, and you look at it and you think, yeah, well, that looks like totally legitimate. Yeah. And away you go. And that's what they're banking on. Now, when which did their research, 1,200 people took part, and 5% said they think they'd fallen foul of something like this. Now, 5% of 1,200 times up by 65 million because everything seems to be online. And that's why the scammers love it, because they only need to get lucky once or twice to actually clean out people's life savings, their pension funds, their inheritance money, everything. And you are left totally and utterly devastated. Just looking at those two websites there on the screen, what, um, what were the differences there? How could, you, how could you spot that the one on the left... Well, you can't. Fake. You can't. You that, can't. That is, that is the, the reality. problem. The, uh, the best thing to do, there is a site called who.is, right? right? Great site. Down. And they check domain registrations, right? So who we... dot is, my friends? But the so... one, sorry, the one on the left-hand side, it's got the security lock on it. I always thought that if you saw the security lock, that meant it was. Up safe. until very recently, no. the security lock was an absolute. Oh yeah, it's perfect. Not so much now because, like no. everything, it's like with new banknotes, people can still copy them. Fraud is so right, prevalent. Right, Aidy, listen, I could talk to you all day. What can people do to be more vigilant? It's easy to go, all oh, the government should do. Yeah. What, what needs to be done? Right. I mean, yes, hold these companies to account, but personally, what can we okay. do? OK. Um, basically, try and pay with your credit card. Don't do it as a bank transfer because you're covered by the Consumer Act with your credit card. Right. If it feels unsafe, you get a gut reaction, don't do it. Come out, talk to a family member, talk to a friend, get them to look at it as right. well. Right, OK. Phone up your bank. Don't phone the number that's on that possible bogus website, but actually get the bank number and give them a call and say, I'm thinking of transferring whatever amount it is. And it, it is the whole thing of buyer beware. And to give you an idea of how bad this problem is, NatWest, who are quite proactive, actually said that they take down lots of sites for all sorts of companies, in particular cri uh, uh, cryptocurrency and insurance and stuff like that. Last year, right, they took down 15,000 sites a month and at its peak, 37,000 a month. That's how big the problem is and it's going to get worse. So oh be goodness. vigilant, check, 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 check. Can I ask, is, do you find a lot of fraud with the apps? Because I certainly wouldn't use necessarily a laptop uh, or a website to transfer money. Would you use my apps? Are they safe? Uh, right. You have to be very careful with the apps as yeah. well. If it's an app you've been using for quite a long time, then fine. But the thing, the problem is, when you look at a domain registration name, uh, that also the company that is the scammers, they have to register with that company. So they're self-regulating and they're not doing a very good job. I love talking to you. Uh, listen, the legend that is Adrian Mills, thank you so much indeed, my friend. We'll see you very soon. Thank you, Adrian. Well, lots more still to come on Talk Today, including the growing threat from Chinese cyber attacks. Have the government gone far enough to protect us from the threat? This is Talk Today. Very good morning. It's almost 7 o'clock. We're coming back and do join us. Otherwise, we'll be here on our own. Zara. <laughs>now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was, supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock on Tuesday, the 26th of March. It absolutely is. You would talk today. We're on TV, of course, on radio, online, and your smart speaker. And these are Tuesday morning's top stories. Sanctions over the China hack. Two individuals and one business are blamed over the 2021 data breach. The Deputy Prime Minister says we must defend our precious democracy. But rebels say the government's actions don't go far enough. Facing up to his critics later, the PM, Mr Sunak, addresses the Liaison Committee just before everybody goes on a big Easter holiday. Labour's Jonathan Ashworth tells us what he would ask Dishy Rishi this hour. And Wales take on Poland on. tonight for a place in the Euros, whilst Declan Rice captains England in a friendly against Belgium. Talk Sports' Shabana Hearn has the latest. And it's another spring-like day. Sunshine for some, but rain or showers for others. I have all the details in the forecast a little later. Thanks, now it's just gone 7 o'clock. Tuesday morning's headlines, the wonderfully talented Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Good morning. The government today being criticised for not going far enough to combat the cyber threat posed by China. Two people and a company have now been sanctioned over potential attacks, which the Chinese embassy in the UK says is completely unfounded. Well, several MPs say the government's not holding China to account and that the response is insufficient given the severity of the situation. And it comes after the Deputy Prime Minister accused the nation of being behind an attempt to access the details of politicians as well as 40 million voters. Well, Labour adviser Mike Buckley's told Talk today he agrees with Oliver Dowden. Apparently they've been targeting local government officials for years and trying to infiltrate and trying to work out who might be friendly towards them on the assumption that these people might in the future go on to become MPs so they can have people in positions of power. This has been a systematic attack on our democracy. Next, in the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It marks a significant shift in the position of the United States on the issue after the country decided not to veto the measure. It's the first time the organisation as a whole has called for an end to the fighting since the war began in October. Well, Yotam Confino from Jewish News UK has told Talk Today America's stance is significant. Of course, this, this marks a change in their diplomatic uh, handling of the situation. The fact that they're abstaining means that the security... Council resolution now passed, and that's why Israel, or at least Netanyahu, the prime minister, is so uh, angry with this. And the U.S. still did criticize the resolution. The fact that they didn't vote yes was because the resolution does not condemn Hamas. 
Well, this comes as the UK's airdropped food supplies into Gaza for the first time. The Royal Air Force parachuted more than 10 tonnes of aid, including water, rice, cooking oil, flour, tinned goods and baby formula to civilians. Meanwhile, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has urged Israel to allow more aid into the war-torn territory. And scientists have made a breakthrough in stopping breast cancer cells going into hibernation and waking up years later, leading to a relapse. Experts from the Institute of Cancer Research in London say the most common form of breast cancer can become dormant for decades, but can later cause a relapse that is more difficult to treat. And the researchers hope that by discovering how the cells work, they can develop treatments to target and kill sleeping cells. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Thanks, Em. Uh, there was a story uh, guys, yesterday about how tractors um, caused uh, London to, to come to a standstill very slowly. And, and we were supporting um, the rural community and farmers. Uh, so I was driving into work, well, being driven yesterday, at four o'clock, uh, half past three, coming through Westminster, uh, Parliament Square, flashing lights, lorries, I mean, tape, everything, diversion, five miles, said to Ben, I went, oh, my God, what's happened there outside Parliament? Terrorist attacks, I mean, think, driven in. Tom Cruise running across Westminster Bridge for Mission Impossible with blood on his shirt. Wow. Amazing. The whole of London comes to a standstill. You won't moan about that. You won't moan about the uh, farmers, but you hate just up oil. I see you, Kyle. <laughs> I well, see, I think there's I a, see a, yes, double standards. Tom, let me tell you, farmers have got jobs. Tom Cruise has got a job. And those lazy, unwashed, middle-class idiots need to get off the roads. But Tom Cruise... And I was going to stop him and say, have you got a part for old Corporal Thorpe in your next film? <laughs> I was doing the agent bit. Well, that's very kind of you, Jeremy. Well, thank you so didn't much. Didn't work, though. He didn't want you. Emily, <laughs> the only Cheers, professional Ed. in the room. Uh, uh, no, right. Adrian was, and he's gone. And he's gone now, yeah. exactly. Well, moving on to our top story this morning. Two people and a company have been sanctioned over Chinese cyber attacks on the UK. In a speech yesterday, Deputy PM Oliver Dowden said that Beijing was behind the attacks on the voter register and on a number of MPs. Our correspondent politically, Alicia Fitzgerald, is back with us. I got her name wrong. Along with broadcaster Matthew Stadlin and security expert, we'll get it. God, there's millions of you. How many you. of us do you need? Jeremy? Well, lots to get us through <laughs> to get us through today, um, ladies, gentlemen. Actually, let's start, Alicia, if we can. Let's just because there's been much response to this. Mm -hmm. This was apparently a hack that took place in 2021, so that's three years ago, that affected 40 million of us uh, electoral register votes, and it's taken the government three years and they've sanctioned two people in a company and if i can just put it into context because i would never agree with the snp but stuart mcdonald said and i quote it's a bit like t turning up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon i mean you've summed it up brilliantly there we go i mean yes this was an attack that happened a good few years ago now and that the government have now just identified as being from china they've said that it was a, a chinese company and they've sanctioned two individuals from that company for for hacking in to this data and retrieving data. And it wasn't just data from the Electoral Commission. There were also certain MPs who have been vocal critics of China whose information has been uh, attacked and gathered there as well. So obviously we had this response from the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, but it didn't really go down too well. Lots of MPs coming forward and just saying it simply wasn't enough. It didn't go far enough. And realistically, will these sanctions actually do anything? Probably not. Uh, will, what could the government have actually done? They say that this is not enough, but how far could they have gone with these, with these sanctions? I think they could have gone much, much further. I mean, what we've got to understand here is we've got a, a very, very complex landscape of attacks. I mean, this is coming on a variety of different levels. I was really surprised that Russia didn't get a name check, nor did Iran, and nor did a number of other state actors who are constantly trying to attack this country. I mean, if we look at and quantify the size of issues, in 2023, worldwide, there were about eight and a half billion cyber attacks across the world. Now, just to cover this small area yesterday, I really felt didn't give justice to the intelligence agencies, particularly GCHQ, who are working incredibly hard behind the scenes to try and prevent these types of attacks. So, you know, I, I think on a very basic level, it was a pretty <coughs> disappointing speech. Well, the, the world has changed. I mean, you talk about, um, you know, our infrastructure. You talk about cyber attacks. The world has changed. Cold War information, I was talking, talking yeah. about. You say harvesting data. There's a lot of people watching this who will go, well, hold on a minute. I mean, you know, they're just blaming China or they're trying to... But, but it is a genuine, genuine fear. If, if 40 million of your voters' details, whether some of that's online or not, can be harvested... 
we have to wise up. I mean, I thought mm. flimsy was an understatement. I thought he, he, I think he's dowdy anyway. That his speech was just not. I, I don't know. It didn't really fill me with the belief. In fact, I rather cynically thought you just mentioned it because we're in election year. Do something about it, security-wise, right? I, I, absolutely. And I think there was zero take-home for members yeah. of the general public who were listening into this. And I think what people have to understand are and are beginning to understand a great deal more these days is that. The intelligence gathering by foreign state actors is gathering pieces of a jigsaw puzzle about each of us, whether it be who we voted for, what social media we use, uh, what our buying habits are. It's creating what we call a pattern of life of each of us individuals. Now, China has the capability. They have the algorithms, the sophistication and the technology and the manpower behind it to put together and construct these jigsaw puzzles of basically the demographics across the United Kingdom. Now, this is where it becomes really dangerous, because although they were talking about members of uh, Parliament being banned from using TikTok, does that mean everybody in their household, their children? So it's, again, influencing sentiments. It's influencing over and beyond trying to skew numbers, for example, of those that are voting. It's looking at influencing the sentiment of those voting, whether that be through deep fake, through AI, through misinformation, disinformation, so many different what ways. What about TikTok? We were talking about that yesterday, we were, we? Yeah, yeah, Matthew, like, on one hand, you know, these sanctions are being brought on China or these two individuals and a Chinese company. Then on the other, there's millions of people across the country who've downloaded TikTok, for example, that is already harvesting... Our, our, our data is being harvested on a daily basis. Well, you think of Henkley Point, you think of the way in which we are sort of inextricably almost bound up with China. We're massive consumers of their goods. So it just shows what a complicated world we live in. I thought Ian Duncan Smith, who's one of those people who's actually been sanctioned by China, former Conservative Party leader, of course, and still a Tory MP, he put it best. He said that the government's response was like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. <laughs> yeah, we spent most of this morning trying to work out what the heck that means, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, I, 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 just, just back to Will quickly, guys. Yeah. We'll talk about... I mean, TikTok... Yeah. Algorithms, yeah. information. I bring it back to everyday people who will be thinking, oh, come on, what would you say? What would, would your advice be to people? Because we've been sat here for months saying we need to understand that this China-Russia-Iran axis has major impacts and is going to... If we sit here and go, oh, no, come on, let's have it, we're going to be... I don't know. Where well, are we going to end up? I think, I think, firstly, we can't believe what we necessarily read or see on social media. I think we also have to bear in mind that any particular product that comes out of China that we utilise on a daily basis is going to be feeding that audience with a, a message that the Chinese state is necessarily going to want to push. So you look at, for example, things like TikTok. The product, or if you like, the content which is actually shown on the app in China is about furthering oneself, about being industrious, about education. Whereas we're seeing over here, it's jumping on milk crates, it's uh, <coughs> eating Tide Pods, whatever it might be. It's a dumbing down to a particular audience. And there, again, it's pervasive in the message. And I'm not saying necessarily TikTok, I'm, I'm saying any social media that potentially comes over here. I would just say this different but important that Elon Musk is the guy who now runs and owns Twitter, and he's got a very serious agenda of his own. Some of the content he pushes out, I think, is really quite chilling. On the response of the UK government, by the way, I mean, they've nicked 40, 40 million of our addresses, and what have we done? We've slapped sanctions on a couple of individuals and Completely some minor-looking organisations. No, no, I, I can... Do we need... I mean, so many times, really, everybody, we talk about on this show... Uh, start with you, Will. We talk about social media companies, the big tech companies being brought to task more, 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 more regularly and, and yeah. in, in a far Take straighter... more responsibility. Is, is yeah. that something the government should look at? We as a society... Is Absolutely. social media... Is it time for social media to be, I don't know, regulated I, more? I, I, you know, I, I, you may or may not know, I wrote a book about, you know, how parents are able to sort of help their children or control their children. And the one thing you've got to bear in mind is that any age up to about 13, there is best practice that as a parent you've got to also instill into children. But beyond 13, they will surpass their parents' capability and te technological know-how. And, and My son's five and he's passed me already. <laughs> well, exactly. And I think, I think you've got to also bear in mind as a parent that as much as the government may try and impose certain controls, again, we don't want too many controls put in place because once they're in place, they're very difficult to remove. That as a parent, you know, until that child's paying for the use of that phone and the, and the phone itself, yeah. it's on loan to 
to the child. Alessia, with the, the politicians that you speak to, the conversations that you have, do you think there's a growing concern about the external influence uh, of, of so-called bad actors on the general election coming up? Definitely. I mean, this has been murmuring for quite some time now. We've got two issues. We've got China specifically, which has been cropping up probably a bit more recently than it has um, over the past kind of decade or so. Our relationship with China has deteriorated and re China's relationship with Russia has grown and improved. So that has definitely been very present in the UK government. But they've always just been a bit too afraid to actually label them as a threat, which they actually have done now, which is... Which is... Why? Why now? It, you know, I know this, where she's this going attack, with this. Well, no, this attack happened three, no, I mean, I'm three years ago. Why has it taken three years? Why has it taken three years? We found out about it end of last year, sort of publicly. So why is it the front page news yesterday? Why have they really pushed it out yesterday? I think this was Dave, probably just a straw bait breaking camel's back it. kind of situation. There's been a few situations that have arisen over, over recent years and the government have been a bit cautious by labelling them a threat because... We rely on China for so much. But maybe we need to rely less on China. But that's it. That... But the issue is that we just don't have an alternative right. at the moment. So for so long, they've been too afraid to kind of say, you know, if we labour them as a threat, what does that mean? Are we going to put ourselves in a worse situation than, than we're just currently in? Quickly spell this out as simply as I can. In the old days, you see these things in front of you, newspapers, yes, right? Newspapers, that's how I most that. people in this country got their news, along with the radio, where you'd have trained editors, right? And some, of course, newspapers, maybe all of them, have some sort of agenda, but they are British newspapers. Now, you could argue that we are consuming a lot of our news via, say, TikTok, where ultimately the editor-in-chief is the Communist Party leader in China. Mm. And, and I think also one, I mean, just to add in there as well, I mean, and I take your point and I agree with you entirely, there is no filter of control. Mm. And one of the biggest problems I think I've seen, particularly with X, formerly known as Twitter, is that it's in fact regulated far less than I think it was before. Mm. Um, even some of the fact-checking, the fact-checking fact is even done by other users. It's not actually done by any admin. There's no controls. So the one thing that we've got to so be so cautious of... speech on steroids, you but got that it. comes with problems, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And, and I think really it comes down to the fact that we have to be very careful. I've been seeing some recent deep fakes, some of the technology that's being used, which is frighteningly realistic. It's getting better and better, not by the year, but by the week. That Russian bot response, for example, to the IS attack in yeah. Moscow, yeah. trying to blame Ukraine, that sort of thing, yeah. is very difficult to know and what even, to trust. And even look at the response to, you know, um, Kate Middleton's Princess of Wales uh, video on Friday, immediately there was a cohort of people saying, well, that's AI. And as much as we can dismiss those people, and obviously it should be dismissed, you can understand why there will be a certain section of people who might, believe, you know, struggle to believe certain video content. I mean, it's like the Russia coming out last week and saying that uh, King Charles had died, you know, yes. and, and feeding that intel in. That, you know, again, one of the things that the Chinese intelligence agencies, as well as Russian and Iran, will feed off is conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And any conspiracy theory that is created, however ludicrous it might be, they will give it traction. They will yeah. push it and automate it. I what mean, are we saying very quickly, because we are almost like, what, what are we saying to people? How, how are we, what are we supposed to believe? Well, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to check these things? Briefly. I, OK, so I think that the easiest way of doing it is like traditional intelligence gathering, which is go to various different divorced or, or separated sources to right. confirm or corroborate a particular story that you're seeing. Don't go to one singular source of information. OK, fantastic. Well, thank you both. God, All we three could have spoken you. for ages. Both, yeah, it's thank you, It's an important everybody. conversation, really. It really it is, is important. Really, really important. We could talk you. about it all day. And well done, Alicia, a lot more in the last hour. You said <laughs> I'm going to think of more to say. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia Fitzgerald, broadcaster, Matthew Southern and security expert, Will Geddes. Well, still to come on Talk Today. I'm going to sneeze so you can do this one. Uh, Scott Benton, he was going to take money to lobby anyway. He's jumped before he was pushed. And why theme parks like Alton Towers and Legoland could charge you more on sunny weekends. Can they give anything worse than going up and down and having to pay for it? It's gone. Well, the Mail right. on Sundays, Anna Mahinova and entrepreneur Will Hudson take us through the papers next. This is Talk Today. It is 7.15. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, 
It's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back, my friends. This is Talk Today. What is it? 7.20 on the button. We'll have the weather in just a minute. But here is what else is coming up on the programme this morning. A new dynamic energy price cap is being dis uh, considered, which could see costs fall during off-peak periods. That's in the papers next. Hopefully at 7.25, Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth joins us to discuss uh, Labour's views of the Tory party and the 15 questions they're going to put to him at the Liaison Committee later today. And pub landlords are pleading for help as rising energy bills and the cost of living crisis force them into drastic measures to stay afloat. We're live from a local boozer at 7.45. Is that, Sadly, Ella, is not that in, Ella B again? Yeah, not yeah. in person. I yeah. wish we could go to a We're program. sat here with coffee and a donut. He's in a boozer. First, though, let's, uh, let's go across to the first lady of weather. Nazani Gaffer, good morning. What's happening? Good morning. It's more of the same. Rain, showers, a little bit of brightness out there at times, though. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. I wish I had something new to tell you, but I don't. It's more of the same. Again, we are going to be seeing rain and showers for today. A bit of brightness here and there, but it's all going to stay unsettled for the rest of the week due to the fact that we have low pressure in charge sitting to the west of the UK, swirling through a number of fronts, bringing the rain, bringing the showers that will be heavy and thundery and the brisk winds from midweek. And then into the Easter weekend, yes, it stays unsettled, but the winds become a bit lighter. So in any brightness, it will feel a little bit warmer with uh, temperatures slightly higher as well. But this morning, it's it's a rain that's the name of the game across southern and eastern parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland, across northeast England, eastern parts of Scotland, a few wintry showers there. Everywhere else, mostly fine and bright, but not for long. We are going to see rain start to steadily move its way northwards across central and southern parts of England and Wales. For Scotland this afternoon, though, plenty of sunshine on the cards, but it's cold air sitting up there, so wintry showers likely, particularly around the Aberdeenshire area this morning as well. Northern Ireland, cloudy with patchy outbreaks of rain and spells of rain that will turn heavy and rather persistent at times across the Midlands, the eastern parts of Wales, 
central, southern and eastern England through this afternoon. So a rather soggy affair across these areas. In any brightness, though, for the northeast of England, the southwest later, uh, it will feel quite uh, mild with temperatures up to 12 degrees Celsius around average for the time of year. But in the sunshine across Scotland, it stays cold because there's colder air sitting up there. Now, that rain will steadily move its way northwards overnight over towards Northern Ireland, Northern England, Southern Scotland, hitting that cold air across Scotland. That means there will be some snow across parts of the highlands uh, over towards areas of Aberdeen, mostly across the high ground. Further south and west, somewhat drier with some clear spells, but more rain piling into the southwest again. And that will again move its way northeastwards through tomorrow across England and Wales. Either side of that, there will be some brightness. And in fact, showers will start to spread through later in the day. So for Scotland tomorrow, it's a cloudier, wetter picture with some wintry showers across the north. Still quite cold there. Sunnier skies for Northern Ireland tomorrow, but with showers and sunshine and showers across England and Wales. Some of these could be heavy and thundery, particularly for Wales and the West Country. Uh, so be aware of some hefty downpours. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Well, now it's time to go through the papers again with the Mail on Sundays, Anna Mahinova and entrepreneur Will Hudson. Welcome back both. Will, we're going to start with you a story in the mirror about um, a subject that we're very passionate about on this show, yep. which is the fight of ju for justice for James Bulger. That's right. That's right. So the, uh, James's mother, Denise Fergus, has been in Westminster, quite rightly shining a light on shortcomings around the release of the individuals who killed James back in 1993. Um, she was there as she attended a debate in Parliament and she actually had the MP Jess Phillips read her words in the House. Fundamentally, what they're questioning is, is why, when uh, Thompson was released in 2001, various incredibly important things were not considered by the parole board. In particular, the fact that, and I apologise to viewers who are about to start the day in a kind of positive frame of mind, but the fact that James was sexually assaulted before being murdered, um, and then it was just vast evidence that Ben was had a sexual interest in children. Mm. And this was not part of the decision to release him in 2001. Now, as we know, he went on to re-offend with regard to child images. Yes. But it beggars belief that these things were not put in front of the relevant bodies well, before so this put was back into society. We, um, we, uh, we, we interviewed Ralph, who's a, I've known for years. Um, I, I'm really, this, this subject is... It, 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 Venables, the, we had the whole thing, and I, somebody sat there and said, let's give him a second, I can't have it. It's been released twice, child images, what you made, your point is incredibly relevant. It is another example, is it not, Anna, of how certain, well, many, but in this instance, these systems need to be far stronger and more stringent. I, I worry, it, we had it with glitter, I, I worry that, that, that in, the, in this society for forgiving everything, there are certain individuals whose crimes are so heinous that they should... I mean, I'm sorry, I make no apology. I'd lock, I'd lock him away and throw away the key. I can't... I'm, I'm not even having that debate. But these two parents whose lives would... I mean, ruined and are now no longer together. I'd so admire the fight from both of them. I really do. Absolutely. And, and obviously, the, the point um, uh, Denise Fergus is making is she is trying to prevent this happening to mm. other parents. She is trying to prevent this happening for other families, which is extraordinary of her because after what she's gone through, you know, it'd be absolutely understandable if she was focused on her grief and that's it. Yesterday but she's actually show, fighting had, for other people. Yesterday on the show, which touched us both, we had... Crystal Owens. The, the mother of, of one of the four yeah. who, of those youngsters who died in that car in Wales, and she is campaigning to say that when you've just passed your test, um, you shouldn't be allowed to, to take... It, it says an awful lot to me about those who go through real trauma, that they've got it in them. And I'm sure it helps, but it says nothing about the fact that those systems aren't in place. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so sad to think, and also Brianna Jai's mother, just how many mothers yeah, of uh, dead or murdered children are yeah. campaigning for change and, you know, hopefully their words don't ring hollow. But the, I think the main thing, exactly as Jeremy said, the strength and the focus and the clarity that some people are able to find in the very darkest moments that life can put you into just blows me away. And I think people like, you know, Denise and people like, you know, Gemma yesterday should be utterly utilised by the governing bodies in this country and, and, and their experience and, and what they've been through should be channelled into changing the law. And it's yeah. beyond me. When we live in a political world where the optics are so bad, to me it's a no-brainer. James Bull, they, they try... What, what really infuriates me about that case for years was those two 
I don't even call them human beings, tried it on another child three minutes before who ran away. So all those people that go, oh, no, 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 no. And no. released twice because of the parole board. And, 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 it's, and, and what she's doing is already having an effect. I mean, yesterday, Justice Minister Edward Arger finally confirmed that the information that Venables had a sexual interest in young children was not logged until 2010 in his wow. files. How is that possible? Yeah. I mean, how... Is it Good on you, it? Denise. Absolutely. Well, we'll move on to another story now, the Daily Mail. Uh, Scott Benton has quit after being embroiled in a lobbying scandal. It's a huge course. loss for democracy. Yeah, well, quite. Um, <laughs> don't, get, don't get caught for thought No, don't, don't, get, don't get me started. Um, why do we think he's quit now? He could have gone forward to a, uh, whatchamacallit, a recall By petition. Election. Yes, yes. So he, a few he, weeks, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, he obviously has had absolutely no hope of winning that, no hope of winning the general election. Mm. Um, Very Let's just explain he's, to well, people who are like, choosing him. This is a man who was caught undercover... Uh, and they basically said, if we give you some money, will you will you lobby for this? I mean, yeah. that, I mean, well, another on example, tape, yeah. Will, which I go on every day and it infuriates everybody. I believe the British people are becoming more and more hacked off with politicians. I don't even want to make it politically based mm. on any particular party. The fact of the matter it's is, please. many people will talk about sleaze and being rotten to the court. And my fear is people just won't turn out the next election for these sorts of examples. Low life. Yeah, well, that's about right. I mean... This is the guy who, who washed into Parliament in a quite unexpected turnaround electorally. This is a this is a red wall MP, 2019, way for the majority. All you might say is this is probably the last fellow who would actually make it into a Conservative uh, majority. So, with luck, the people who get elected most times will be better quality. But yeah. we need to make sure of it because otherwise, faith in our how do is you undermined. how well, do you make sure of it? What are you supposed to do, Nick? How do you make sure that the Scott Bentons and the Peter Bones and people like that don't escape the net? Or, or are we saying that once you become an MP or you're in power, that it goes I, to your I head think and you think you can break the rules? In, let's put in a good word for the Times um, and, and that story, because sunlight Absolutely. is the best disinfectant. Yeah. I think the mm. best way to dissuade future Scott Bentons is exactly this, to report um, and take swift action against mm -hmm. the ones that are there. Maybe if he'd spent more time thinking about his constituents rather than tweeting about Donald Trump, he would have done a better <laughs> job for the people of Blackpool South. Well, stay there, Anna and Will, because uh, we're turning to Westminster now as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will face questions from MPs later today ahead of Parliament's Easter recess. Now, hopefully, fingers crossed, technology in a long while. Joining us to share some of Labour's most pressing questions, good friend of the show, Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth, Go. Is he there? Yes. Ah, there he is. Never lets us down. Good morning. I am here. Good morning, in, Jonathan. In your Mac and again. I, in your Mac and again. Most, Jeremy, I most certainly am a good friend of the show. Delighted <laughs> to be here this morning. Right, Ashworth, me old lad. There are 15 questions that you're setting to Sunak. We picked a couple we want to ask you about. Presumably, the first question should be, come on, Rishi, when's the election, right? I mean, Absolutely. I mean, I thought we would have a general election in May. I always thought we'd have a general election in May because it was, seemed to me it was either a general election or a Tory leadership election. And that sounds like a Tory leadership election could be on the way. The Tory MPs uh, fear that Rishi Sunak is too weak to lead them into a general election. They're worried for their seats. And, of course, he chickened out of that May election. He was, he, uh, he's running scared. Look, the country, after 14 years of Conservative failure, I think there is a yearning for change. And I think we, people want a general election because they're fed up of waiting longer on an NHS waiting list, struggling to see a GP in the morning. They're fed up of the squeeze in the living standards, uh, the prices of everything going up in the shops all the time. So I do think it's time for change and we need that general election. Then I'm going to move to question 11 now. Does the Prime Minister believe that someone who's made racist comments and talked openly about wanting to shoot an MP should continue to donate to him or receive contracts from the public purse? Uh, that's a question that I certainly would like to have answered. Frank Hester, wasn't it? But also, what's the Labour Party's policy in terms of receiving donations from people who've made racist comments? And indeed, will the Labour Party commit to... Um, actually reporting on the findings of the investigation into Diane Abbott, the MP at the centre of this, uh, these horrendous comments, the victim of these comments. Will she be allowed back in the Labour Party in time for the general election? Well, two parts to the question. And the first part, of course, Rishi Sunak should give that money back. 
the fact that he still refuses to do that, I think, again, reveals how weak he is. And I think it's absolutely shameful that his Tory party leaflets that be being put through people's letter boxes now are paid for by that money. On the issue of Diane Abbott, there is an independent inquiry which looks into all of these matters. I can't really comment on it because it is independent and they don't give me a, an update on all the ins and outs of it. But I hope that inquiry proceeds and, um, and that we, it reports and... Uh, an no, outcome you don't to need to know the ins possible. and outs of it. You need to know that it's taken 11 months to come to a conclusion about a very, very short letter. Is it simply the case that the Labour Party are dilly-dallying until the general election is called by Rishi Sunak so they don't have to deal with that so-called issue? No, 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 I don't think it's that, but it's independent, so it's a bit difficult to judge why it's taking so long, because, as I say, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I would hope that they would get on with it, because, uh, understandably, I, we, you know, people are asking questions about it. Nothing wrong with asking questions about it. That's, that's, that, that's entirely uh, reasonable, but... Um, it is an independent inquiry, and I hope it can be resolved. Jonathan, one of the big things that people will say, and we've talked honestly and candidly, you and I, on this show over the years, about um, how the, the Labour Party has changed s systematically from top to bottom from, from four years ago. However, you will acknowledge, whether it's in Redwall or across other parts of the country, there is and will be concerns. You've addressed a lot of them. One of the things that people keep saying to me, and I want to bring you to question A, a US general recently said that the UK is barely a tier two military power. And the dire situation has led to his cabinet colleagues breaking rank by calling for 3% of defence spending. Now, we'll talk about the cyber attacks in a minute. We'll talk about, we can talk about Ukraine and the Middle East. What a lot of people who will vote in the next election, despite a cost of living crisis, want to know is, would a Labour Party guarantee 3% of GDR? Is protecting the United Kingdom and having a strong military what we can expect if you win the general election at some point this year or not? Because the past, for you as a party, is apparently very different to right now. So what would you and how would you answer that? Well, protecting the national security of the United Kingdom and the people who live here has to be your number one priority for anyone seeking elected office. It is the foundation of everything you stand for. And it is incredibly serious at this time when we know there are so many threats in the world, whether that is from Russia or the, what we're seeing on the cyber security front in the news in the last 24 hours. In terms of the actual figures, that you're, we, we've got to make tough decisions on the public finances, but all of our position will be outlined in our manifesto on future expenditure. I mean, it is, we've got to be honest that if the Labour Party forms a government, we are inheriting an almighty economic mess from the Conservatives after 14 years. But I can assure you that national security and defence will always be a foundation of everything we do and will be an absolute priority. Jonathan, from national defence to another national issue that this gets is certainly a lot of our viewers and listeners riled up, potholes. Yeah. Question 14. Uh, the Rishi Sunak in 2021, he was uh, then the Chancellor, said, enjoy National Pothole Day before they're all gone. He promised he would get rid of potholes. Does the Prime Minister accept that his pothole plan has not worked? Jonathan, what's Labour's pothole plan? Lots of cement. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, it's just it's just astonishing, isn't it, that Rishi Sunak was saying enjoy National Pothole Day before they're all gone. I mean, I mean what a... It was a gauche thing for him to say when we know that there are potholes everywhere uh, in all the roads. Look, you know, this is partly about um, uh, investment in local government and our councils. And if you grow your economy, you can put the investment that you need into public services. But I think, I think this is one of the things that is driving people berserk, that Rishi Sunak made a big promise on potholes and he's completely failed to deliver on any of his promises on that front. Jonathan, thank you so much. I'm going to be told off very quickly, 10 seconds. The Chinese cyber security threat, Dowd and Yesterday, three years, two companies and an individual. It was slightly flimsy. Don't we need to be more vigilant, stronger in our response, Labour's response to that? Well, we've got to, keep, we've got to always keep all these things uh, under serious, serious review. We can never uh, undermine national security, nor democratic integrity. I think we need a f full audit now of all of our relations with uh, uh, China to really understand what's going on. But I think this is something we're going to be returning to quite a lot uh, because of the, the level of seriousness now and the gravity attached to this is 
rising. And I think this is, I think we're going to be talking about this a lot more on your show in the weeks to come. Jonathan, thank you. Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth. Anna and Will thank still you. here. Um, I, I made the point, Anna, uh, four years ago, they were on their backsides. I'm really interested. Um, do you buy Labour's thing? Do you buy another audit? Another, what, what do you get from a reaction to that? Well, I mean, the thing to say about China is, I, I, I thought you was completely right that you asked that question. Um, he's saying we'll have an audit. But I was just sitting there thinking, what is their China policy? I, I actually have no idea. I don't know if Keir Starmer is tough on China or soft on China or middle of the road on China. I, I sort of feel like we don't really know anything. Do you know what the government's position on China well, is? That's an, another very good point, and we don't really, and, and I have had ministers in this government say to me, we've asked number 10 what is our position on China, we've not had an answer, because there's no state of China policy. That's an absolute a, a travesty uh, in the current climate. But equally, it is odd that the opposition, we, we sort of, going into an election with these huge geopolitical um, moments, and both leaders aren't that interested in foreign policy, it seems. Yeah. What do you make of his comments there? Um... Well, I think his Mac is bang on. <laughs> because he's a pretty beige a bold move, series of it's comments, quite... oh, in my wow. opinion. I Let's have an audit on what's going on with China. I mean, at a certain point, I think you need to draw people uh, out. And you know, we would like to hear what does that mean sure. in concrete terms. But it's one of those where... <laughs> At every turn, you see no incentive for Labour to stick their neck out no. as long as the Tories are failing on it, because why would they bother? But they yeah. keep saying, when the manifesto, when the manifesto, and I guess when that manifesto comes out, that's the time well, for us to look at the, the meat on the, on the bone. There you go. Uh, guys, thank you so much indeed. A shorter one, but you'll be back in the next hour. Anna and Will. Now, pubs across Britain are pleading for help as soaring costs are forcing them into drastic measures in order to stay open. One pub facing the struggle is in South Yorkshire. It's the old George Inn. Why did I do that? Uh, the landlords here have had to shut their doors by 9pm most nights as there are so few customers. Well, Talk Today correspondent Nick Ellaby joins us now from the inn. Nick, pubs are struggling to cope with the pressure, aren't they? Good morning. Morning, Nick. Morning, Jeremy. Yes, they are. I mean, you know me, any chance to come to a pub, happily uh, be here in the morning. Listen, this is, at the moment, a potential national tragedy. One in three pubs around the country, we're hearing, are having to close early to save on costs. And actually, the British Beer and Pub Association is saying that 509 pubs closed last year and a further 750 could be lost by June if we, do something, if we don't do something about it. It's both the owners you know, to diversify and look at ways they can, they can get more business in, but also on us as the customers to start using our local pubs a bit more. I'm here at the old George Inn in Psych House in Yorkshire. Uh, fantastic place. Just have a look at the fire. We're by the roaring fire here. Absolutely stunning building. And I'm here with the owners, Rosie and John Nagati as well, who are doing various things to try and bring a bit more money in. Rosie, good morning. Just tell us how tough things are at the moment. Oh, I mean... On a weekday, we are usually closed by nine o'clock. The latest, if people aren't in by half past eight on a night, which is our last orders for food, our staff tend to start closing down. And what are the costs in terms of opening up and, and that are really sort of prohibitive on for you? On a day that myself and John aren't working, so we have staff out front, it costs us about £250 just to open the doors and stay open for a full eight, nine hours a day. We have electricity, heating, kitchen running at full capacity and staff Fantastic. working for us, yeah. Thank you, Rosie. So, I mean, it's expensive just to open up if those customers are not coming through the door. It's really, really tricky. But what these guys are doing are various other projects to help bring money in, which pubs really across the country are doing. Good morning, John. Just tell us about how you're diversifying here, what you've got going on at the Old George. If there's anything extra that we could do, we, 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 we do. We, we uh, put bike nights on every Wednesday. Um, we've got a, a camping field opened up at the back where we've got um, glamping yurts with log burning hot tubs. Um, I mean, any ideas whatsoever that people come and give us that we, we, we try and run with. Live music. We've got live music live as well. Music, open so, mic nights. Rosie, you were saying the plan is to become, you know, a, a campsite with a pub rather than a pub with other things, is that right? Absolutely. I mean, our village is quite a small village, um, so we can't rely on just our locals. People have to drive out to us. So driving, they can only have maybe one pint. Obviously, we don't condone drinking and driving. Um, so it doesn't, 
it doesn't give us a cost per head. Um, with a campsite, it means that people can actually go out, have a good time, enjoy spending time in the pub, having a few drinks on a night, and then staying here without having to get a taxi home, which is obviously really difficult in a rural location anyway. Absolutely. OK, well, I mean, we were here last night as well, and it's not just drinkers in here. There was a, a ladies' coffee and sewing night as well. And, you know, the pub... It's a real community hub, isn't it? It's a place where people from the village or people from your area can come, can make friends, can meet each other, can be somewhere where they can get together. And, and it just helps boost the community and people's mental health. I mean, the government will say they have offered 75% business rates reduction and also frozen alcohol duty, but places are asking for more help. John, just tell me, what could the government do, or a future government, to help businesses like yours? Obviously, the, 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 the beer prices have gone through the roof all, over the past few years. Um, we obviously have to pass that on to the, the customers, unfortunately. So if they were going to cut the VAT um, overall, then it's going to help us, which we're going to be able to pass that on to um, our customers. Fantastic. John, thanks very much. Guys, so that's it. A bit more help on VAT. Really going to help businesses like this. I'll probably have a cheeky breakfast pint, and I'll see you back here in an hour. <laughs> Guys. You see what I mean? Cheers, Nick Ellaby in South Yorkshire there. Have can a round I, on me. Can I just ask you a women's coffee and sewing night? Yes, what about it? Just saying, Garrett Club, women's coffee and sewing night. I don't Club. think it's the same, Jeremy. You'd be very welcome at a sewing club, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd love see to see you with a needle and thread. I'm not going anywhere near that. That's Chris, absolutely right. Uh, listen, throw out as ever on the show your involvement. We've been talking about these Chinese cyber attacks and, frankly, a rather uh, a sort of insipid response by Oliver Dowdy Dowden yesterday and, and all sorts of people, uh, including uh, Ian Duncan Smith. How did you describe it? It was like... He said it was like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Not sure what that means. Make of that what you will. Thank you for your comments. Trixie, uh, everyone needs to get out and vote. Uh, Robert right. agrees. That's why voting in person with photo ID is important. Uh, Jade says, what difference are our concerns going to make? We know our politicians will fail to, act, fail to act on time. And that's what a lot of people think. And it's about trust, right? How can we even trust that these text messages have come from real viewers? Maybe we've been hacked. Oh, God. Reem, <laughs> why can't China mind its own damn business? They have a large population. They already rule the world market. Is dominating the world on their cards totally next? And Bethan says, we're coming out hard this time, so I doubt the Chinese will be able to interfere in our election. Coming out hard? Listen, with respect, Bethan, I appreciate you coming. Coming out hard, the Bantu companies and one individual. No, as in, like, the British public will be coming out hard ah, to vote. Ah, right. <laughs> there we go. I don't believe she exists, though, Bethan. I think she's come from a Chinese spy. That thing, TikTok, you crack on, I'll shut up. I will do. Well, still to come on the show, Shaban's got your sport. Oh, lol, thank you, Nicola. Yes, a big night for Wales as they prepare to face Poland for a place in the Euros. Meanwhile, the three Lions, minus an injured Harry Kane, take on Belgium in a friendly as Declan Rice takes the helm. And new laws are imposed to keep fans to keep trouble at bay. I'll have all the details coming up next on Top Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.48. Now it's make or break for Wales tonight as they take on Poland for a place in this year's Euros. Talk Sport Shibana Hearn is with us, of course, the first lady of sport. Uh, Shibana, I really, I, I, I'm not Welsh, but I just want them to get through. I, I, I really, honestly, don't you? Yes, 100%. I want I don't all care the about English. the England stupid game against Belgium. I care about Wales this beating is, Poland. It's such a huge game, but the thing is, now they could be going to qualify for their fifth major out of four. Which Rob nice. Page's men are a brilliantly young, fresh side, but they've got experience now when it comes to their caps. I think the average number of caps of that squad is something like 43, which is incredibly experienced when you think about it. So a huge game. It's against Poland. Uh, Rob Page has made a little cheeky shady dig at um, Poland, saying that Lewandowski and co are here in the playoffs like us for a reason. So they certainly feel mm -hmm. that they have a chance against them, but Did also the at Cardiff... Oh, the, good, the good thing about a playoff game, like a cup final, it, any team can can nick it with a goal. What do you genuinely think? Have Wales got a chance tonight? I think they win tonight. I do think you? They win. I think Are you here tomorrow? Yes, I'm here right, tomorrow. Right, that's her prediction. I hope you're right. Cheeky fiver on that. I mean, I, I cheeky think... Cheeky fiver on that. Cheeky fiver on that there, please. Uh, I think they've got a great chance. Again, the squad is an outstandingly talented squad with some superstars in there too. So, no, I think they've got that... They've got the minerals to go all the way. Also, they do not want to miss out on this opportunity to keep qualifying for major shows. Like How many have they done, did you say? You, do you this know will what you be said? four you said, out of five. Yeah, you said five out of four. Did that? Yeah, you Smart did. of me. Worked oh, that one out. Really. <laughs> they were absent from major tournaments for 58 years. Yes. And then yeah. suddenly just amazing. And wow. the thing is, they're, they're missing the key man, Gareth Bale. But now they're starting to make it work right, without See, him. now we're going to have yeah, a debate. Yeah. See, but, oh, hello. No, no, but I think when the team is based around one individual... The further you go down the line and you, in brackets, become dependent on that person, I think Bale leaving has actually done Wales a massive favour. Because now we can focus on Brennan Johnson, Nico Williams, Harry Wilson, Ethan Ampadu, a number of players yeah. who are performing at high levels. They've got a number of players in the Championship Completely too. Completely agree. So actually they sort of come of to team. the party, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. I think they deserve to be there. Good luck for Wales tonight. We want to see... Yeah, yeah. come yeah. on, the Wales. I'm not going to do a Welsh accent for it's reasons that I'm not going into. the toughest to do. I bet you you can do oh, lovely, well, is my, it? My mum's Welsh, so oh, okay. I, well, she, I find it? myself... I'm able to... Come on then, do it, it then. No, uh, so 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 that out. Uh, to do it. Another dance floor. So I'm going to be torn with which match to watch tonight because England are also playing oh. Belgium. <sighs> Listen, don't Who worry about cares? England. They'll be fine. <laughs> the you said that about Brazil. <laughs> Harry Kane's injured. Good. Harry Kane is injured. He's actually back now training with Bayern Munich. He if he's injured, why is he training with Bayern Munich? I saw those pictures and said he can't play for England. He's training in, in Germany. Well, why? he's back in rehab and back with his oh. squad at Bayern Munich. It doesn't necessarily mean he's playing games because we are still on the international break. But a lot of 
injured players would go back to club okay. to recover with them. So that is the case for Harry Kane. OK, you're missing the likes of Kyle Walker. Harry Maguire's now out with an injury. Sam Johnson, Bukayo Saka, Luke Shaw, Trent, Alexander-Arnold. But Gareth Southgate still has that headache selection. But one thing that has been easy for him to do with the absent Harry Kane is select a new captain I'm for this so game. I'm so excited about this, my boy. I bet you are. Um, Declan Rice, for his 50th cap for England, will lead out the boys tonight at Wembley to face Belgium. And what I think I would say, tell me as an Englishman, you want to see is an exciting game, a change from Brazil? Yeah, there was no end product in Brazil. Jim White suggested you should do this for a living. I mean, for me, the team picks itself because they missed Saka on the left, Foden was impotent on the right, mm. Kane up the middle, and you've got Rice and Bellingham, who I think are incredible. Can I just say about Declan Rice, we, we listen and we read so much about footballers, bling, women, wags, life. This is... He so reminds West Ham fans of what Bobby Moore was about. He lives and breathes football. He's a family guy. Nobody... I mean, some West Ham fans booed him the other day, but nobody denies that he got the chance to go to Arsenal. I think it's a great moment for him, and I think he absolutely... I mean, look, he's, yeah, Bellingham is Bellingham, but mm. for me, future England captain by a mile. I agree. By a can, mile. Can I just flag something to you tonight also? When you watch the game tonight, we're going to have the commentary live on Talk Sport, but in the second half, there'll be no names in the back of the England shirts. Reason being... They're Nike's that. idea, is it? Not Nike's idea. It's uh, to focus on the study for dementia, so I hope you feel Good. bad about yourself. No, 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 that's um. right. I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm not. Listen, that's great. We had all the thing with Nike last week. Yeah. You've done me completely there, haven't you? You've done yourself. Just, yeah, just <laughs> look at the up. look on her face. Crack um, on there, yeah, so that, When you see that game tonight and you do think, oh, why have they not got names in the back of the shirt? It is to be awareness right. for My today. wife People says... Do my wife says you've messed up. I try talking sometimes. Why <laughs> have you not mentioned Danny Kerr retiring from international yes, rugby? Yes, he has retired from rugby. Well, we were about it to, Vic, but topic. you've jumped in now. Can I just say, so people aren't going to be up in arms about them changing the uh, the back of the England shirts yeah. in support of dementia, but no. they were all up in arms because they changed the England flag to look like the 66 kit. It doesn't make sense to me, anyway. By the way, do you well, think... Well, no, see, they, now we're going to have an argument. St George's the... flag is red and white. Of course it makes sense. Jeremy, yeah. do you know how many times they've changed the colours of the St George's flag? When? So when? many times on different tournaments throughout the years. And this time, it was changed to that purple shade so that it was reminiscent of the 1966 it's training it's kit. But do, do you also know that they actually like that. changed it in 2011 too? The difference is now yeah. is social media brings it to such a front exactly. and everyone gets such an opinion. But they actually, on the back of the shirt of 2011, yeah. had multiple little England flags yeah. in different colours yeah. and nobody complained about it then. It's not, it's not the first You've time You've got it's the happened. wrong colour on yourself today, haven't you? I know. I forgot. I've been wearing red for Wales. Scotland I really want to talk Ireland. about <laughs> this story. Uh, more, than, more than 1,600 football hooligans yeah. and cokeheads will be banned from leaving Britain during the Euros. Yeah, uh, as we were discussing, how do we know exactly who that is? But Dave you... says they're on a list already. They've yes. been prosecuted, right? right. Pretty much a that. A banned list. And this will crack down on any trouble that might happen in Germany, ahead, Germany sorry, ahead of the Euros. It's a new law imposed from today. It will force Yobs to surrender their passport to police and any failure or comply or attempt to travel to the host nation Germany faces six months in prison. I actually think it's a good thing because I think Scotland kicking off the Euros, I mean, we're all there for a good old party, but let's be very, very careful because things can get out of hand. Right, so do what my wife wants then, ladies, please. After 101 caps and 15 years representing England national level, Danny Kerr has retired from international duty, Mrs Kyle. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Listen, uh, it, 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 she always says to me, Rugby players are different class to footballers. They are. They are. The, 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 the camaraderie after a game, mm, just yeah. everything is different gear. Yeah. Danny Kerr's a proper player. 101 yeah. caps. Yeah. I wonder if he'll retire now. From... Going to continue with Harlequins, I think, yeah, the rest that's of the, the season. Plan, yeah, but yeah. Like 300 odd appearances. But even the wife's getting old. But... She used to sit there and go, oh, George Ford. And even he's beginning to I get know. old. How you know dare I mean? you say that your wife's getting old? My goodness. <laughs> well, not as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No one is as old as you. Well, that's uh, a bit Really harsh. quickly, we don't have very long. Uh, Andy Murray's out oh, for an extended yeah. period. He's um, had an interior ligament damage, ATFL and CFL, um, a severe tear. Um, so he's now going to. Like, have a look at what the next step says, Just but he's retire. now going to be out with No everybody. steps, because he can't walk. Ironic, of... really, to use that language, isn't it? But, um, we're sending uh, best wishes to Andy. I would love to see him at Wimbledon, but this looks Just like retire, mate. It's done. You are so out of order for no, saying that. Why don't you retire? Legis I am. Legacy. Yes, legacy. Why don't you retire? Who says legacy. I'm not retiring? <laughs> Thank you, Shabbat. <laughs> I'll be taken out of my hands. There we go. Lots more <laughs> still to come on tour today, including the rising threat from Beijing. Can the UK counter Chinese cyber attacks? We'll speak to a security specialist. This is Talk Today. It is 7.56. That's it. I'm retiring. Good Goodbye. morning. Oh, thank God.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Ah, they are, my friends. Good morning. It's just gone 8 o'clock on Tuesday, the 26th of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories this morning. Sanctions over the Chinese hack. Check this. Two individuals and one business have been blamed over a data breach going back three years. The Deputy PM, Oliver Dowden, says we must defend our precious democracy, but critics say the government's actions are at best flimsy. Well, save our boozers. Pubs across the country struggle, struggle to cope with mounting costs as bills rise and custom declines. We're live from a local in South Yorkshire. E by gum. And, check this, should a mother ever meddle in a son's love life or, get this, set a test for their potential other half? We'll debate that this hour. Wow. And it's a typical spring-like day. We've got sunshine, we've got showers, and we've got rain, even some wintry outbreaks. I have all the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. We start with some breaking news from the United States. In the last hour, a major incident's been declared after a cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, which has caused the whole thing to collapse into the water. Baltimore City Fire Department say seven people and several vehicles have fallen into the river following the incident, which happened during the middle of the night there. 
a large multi-agency rescue and recovery operations underway right now. The ship is thought to be registered in Singapore and it's not yet clear why it ran off course. We'll bring you more on this breaking story as we get it. The government is today being criticised by MPs for not holding China to account and not going far enough to combat the cyber threat posed by the country. Two people and a company have been sanctioned over potential attacks, which the Chinese embassy in the UK says is completely unfounded. It comes after the deputy PM accused the nation of being behind an attempt to access the details of politicians as well as 40 million voters. Well, security expert Will Geddes has told Talk Today the UK isn't doing enough to stop the attacks. I was really surprised that Russia didn't get a name check, nor did Iran, and nor did a number of other state actors who are constantly trying to attack this country. I mean, if we look at and quantify the size of issues, in 2023, worldwide, there were about 8.5 billion cyber attacks across the world. So the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It marks a significant shift in the position of the United States on the issue after the country decided not to veto the measure. It's the first time the organization as a whole has called for an end to the fighting since the war began in October. In the United States, officers have raided the homes of rapper Sean Diddy Combs in Los Angeles and Miami. The Department of Homeland Security said it carried out the searches as part of an ongoing investigation by federal agents in three separate regions. Several recent lawsuits have accused the musician of sexual misconduct. And a man in Australia has finally been freed after getting trapped for 36 hours inside a drain. He first entered the underground network in Brisbane on Saturday while trying to retrieve his phone. However, emergency services had to be called after he spent hours wading through stormwater to try to find an exit. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour. G'day, mate. I come from a land down under. I'm sorry. Dave, brilliant. That is, that's my favourite story that we've ever spoken about. Very Mike, nice. you're from Australia, floor manager. Have you ever been underground for 36 hours, my little no. possum? No. <laughs> no. Thank you, Emily. What Marvelous. an incredible story. Thank you, Emily. Also, we'll keep you updated. That horrific uh, view. Awful. Of that. that footage is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. That bridge collapse in Baltimore. And the world we live in, my first thing when I saw it was, is that a terrorist thing? Because a boat... In the middle of the night, surely they would know. I mean, in the, I don't know if you've seen those pictures. We're playing them again. The whole thing's come down. Seven fatalities. That is a major, major I news mean, story, and we will bring that to you. The it Baltimore must have been so, wow. like a hell of a crash. We don't know about fatalities at the moment. We know that seven, seven people have gone in. Oh right, um, okay. So but there's a multi-agency rescue operation underway. But for you know, it must have been a big crash for for the whole thing to, to collapse like that. You just don't imagine that that's what happens. But terrifying. Uh, more really on terrifying. that throughout the morning. And, and also, um, thank you so much indeed, by the way, for all of your comments this morning. We've been talking about these Chinese uh, cyber attacks. Talk about it more in mm. just a tick. Um, and we sort of asked you, are you worried about you know interference in? Our democracy in the general election, however you put it. Thank you to Oscar. Uh, the threats posed by cyber attacks cannot be undermined, along with the risk that the attack can be carried out from any location by anyone or on any services of the country. I believe the focus should urgently be pivoted towards strengthening cyber security. Absolutely. When you consider, like, um, during lockdown, when we had the test, track and trace that cost billions and billions of pounds and we couldn't even get our act together on that. Didn't no. even work. It makes you worry, doesn't it, about the state of our, our cyber intelligence or certainly cyber security, Oscar. Uh, John from Lincolnshire texted us his views. Uh, he says, what was our reaction to the repeated cyber attacks by the Chinese? Nothing. Uh, if we had a strong and competent leader, we should have withdrawn our ambassador or summoned theirs to express our anger over such a major hacking scandal that breached all the protocols. So it is our main top story. Uh, two people today and a company have been... Just check that. Two people and a company, this That's was three it. years ago, have been sanctioned over Chinese cyber attacks in the United Kingdom in a particularly, well, I'd say dour speech yesterday. Deputy PM Movala Dowden said Beijing was behind the attacks on the voter register and on a number of MPs. Well, joining us now are political editor at Tortoise Media, Kat Nealon, and Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Kat... Good morning. Mm. It's quite worrying that this happened three years ago. The public were made aware of it mm. end of last year. And only these sanctions, seemingly quite minimal sanctions, are being brought about today. 
Yes, and the sort of relative inaction has been uh, attacked by Conservative MPs. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to agree, the sort of Labour opposition as well, they said they were supportive of some of the measures, but had several questions about exactly how we got to this stage. Um, but really, the kind of biggest attacks have come from, uh, well, perhaps the people you might expect, you know, some of the people are the ones that uh, the MPs that have been attacked themselves. Ian Duncan Smith, former party leader, Tim Loughton, former children minister. They are among the most vocal uh, China hawks and they are the ones saying uh, this just doesn't go far I enough. Ian Duncan Smith, Benedict, mm. um, described uh, the UK's response mm. as like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Um, uh, Stuart MacDonald, who I, is an SNP, I mean, the SNP and I would never be on the same page, but he said uh, ministers of, um, can be accused of turning up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon. Mm. I mean, a lot of people, mate, watching this will go, oh, come on, but it is becoming increasingly obvious, is it not, that that axis that we've talked about before, Russia and China and Iran, this is a, a threat to the United Kingdom and cyber security is at the forefront now. I mean, uh, Dominic Cummings a few months ago gave an interview to Dorakish Patel where he was saying uh, that when he was in his role, obviously, he was privy to all kinds of information that the average person wouldn't be. And he said when he was made clear just how deeply Chinese intelligence had penetrated all corners of the British uh, establishment, uh, online systems, everything. Uh, it sent him into a sort of a whirl of 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 of, of, of horror. Actually, at how deeply this goes. Um, it, less so Iran. Iran is uh, not very competent in a lot of things, and it piggybacks uh, onto what the other two do. But I think uh, it's a sign, really, of China's influence of its authority. But the problem is. We can't, when you're talking about the size of the sanctions, we're not really in a position where we can sanction China especially well because of the depth to which actually China is deeply ingrained in the global economy, let alone the British economy. That has been the entire strategy of the Chinese authorities for the last 10, 20 years to become deeply ensconced in as many economies as possible so that you can't sanction them without causing major economic harm to yourself. And we saw this actually with the sanctions on Russia. Actually, there was an initial crippling of the Russian economy, but then it just expanded outwards. But actually, who was it who suffered as a result of sanctions on Russia? Well, it tended to be a lot of European countries uh, who were relying on Russia because Russia had become uh, too deeply... And they deeply just sold important. their oil to China. Yeah, we'd become too deeply dependent on something that they provided us. That's what these powers do. They know exactly what they're doing and it means that they feel that they can therefore get away with this sort of thing. So whilst we talk about the weak response, the, re the reaction has to be, well, well, what do we do? Do we stop Chinese tech firms? Do we stop, you know, throw, you know, uh, kick out the Chinese ambassador? There's actually very little that you can do because we have allowed ourselves and it has to go back to say, you know, David Cameron was the one that rolled out the red carpet for Xi Jinping. We were very happy to take their money and their investment. Uh, and now, if you like, the chickens are coming home to roost. We are unable to kick these people out of our economy because bits of it would stop working. Well, let's bring in security expert at Buckingham University, Professor Anthony Glees, who joins us now. Uh, Anthony, good morning. We talk about attacks on MPs and the 40 million voters uh, in our electoral register. But what does an attack actually look like? What kind of information is being gained? Good morning. Good morning. Well, lots and lots of <clears throat> different kinds of information. Uh, China wants to hoover up everything it can about us, and some of it will be apparently meaningless information, useless information. Some of it will be highly sensitive. Some of it will be acquired, a lot of it acquired by digital means, by phishing and spear phishing and whaling, these technical terms which uh, denote that, uh, that hackers are using very highly targeted email approaches to extremely important people to get them to divulge information. But then, you know, the ordinary business of spying. Uh, we've been told by MI5 that the Chinese have had a, a spy in a sensitive position in the House of Commons, spying on the, uh, Alicia Kearns, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee Chairman, and Tom Tugendhat, the Security Minister, not to mention Ian Duncan Smith and people like him. So across the board, you have a huge penetration of our critical national infrastructure in this country by China. Um, our prime minister has told us it's an epoch-making event, what is going on. And we all thought yesterday that Oliver Dowden was going to announce something really important to protect people. Of course, there are things that you can do to protect yourself. I mean, we're not totally prone. And every single person 
is in a sense a target and they can do things to safeguard their email, change their passwords, et cetera, et cetera. But once the Chinese get hold of NHS records, once they get hold of uh, the records of the Electoral Commission and all the other stuff they're doing, they are in a position to put their hands around our neck. Uh, and Anthony, if I could I just jump in, welcome, the... welcome to the show. Can I just ask you, I mean, a lot of people responded yesterday and went, that was flimsy. If you think, well, it's been three years, two, two blokes or two people and a company, what would you as a security expert, listening to what uh, Benedict said, that because they're so ingrained in our society, it becomes very difficult to sanction them, what needs to be done from your experience, from a security point of view, to stabilise our country against such attacks? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, what Oliver Dowden said needed to be done. He said the choice was China's. He said it, it, China has to choose whether or not it wishes to go down this uh, line. Now, what I would say is, no, the choice isn't China's. The choice is ours. We have to decide if we simply want to take this lying on our back or if in operational terms, we want to do something to stop the Chinese. If the Chinese are embarked, as they are, on an intelligence gathering and subversive set of activities against the United Kingdom, we have to think about counterintelligence and counter-subversion. So it's not up to China, it's up to us. Yes, we do £100 billion worth of trade mutually with China right now, and we would take a hit but we'll take a far bigger hit if we do nothing. So I'm not saying we should be turning the lights out in Beijing, but we need a much more efficient security service. We need a much more efficient cybersecurity service. And we need to educate people of the danger. Would we rather be secure or would we rather be trading with China? I believe most British people would be sooner secure. They would take that, that hit from China and carry on living the way of life we do. And what the Chinese can do with the Electoral Commission, uh, Oliver Dowding he says, uh, oh, our elections are safe. Excuse me, he cannot possibly know they're safe. We've seen from what's going on in America how if you can destroy people's faith in democracy, democracy itself is at risk. Kat, just bringing you back you. in there, uh, we know that Lord Cameron is going to be at the 1922 committee later today. There's no mechanism for him to be questioned by MPs in the House of Commons because he is, of course, a lord. Um, but yet, as Benedict said earlier, he was the one who kind of rolled out the red carpet for China in previous years. He's currently Foreign Secretary. Surely he should be answerable to the House of Commons. He should be answering questions today about our current position um, on China based more. on his previous decisions as PM. Yeah, and I think there are a lot of Conservative MPs as well as opposition MPs who are quite unhappy about this say, state of affairs. So as it, uh, the way that it works is that he answers questions in the House of Lords and then you have effectively his deputy, Andrew Mitchell, answering questions in the House of Commons. But that is not really ideal and, and situations like this show up just how, how sort of the paucity of having that situation. Um, he did address the uh, backbenchers uh, yesterday afternoon uh, uh, after uh, Oliver Dowden's uh, statement, but a lot of that time was taken up with discussing the situation in Gaza. Um, but that said, I know that there are, again, you know, there are sort of divisions even within the cabinet over which, uh, uh, which is the best approach to take. I mean, we just heard there about the sort of distinction being made between the sort of economic reality and the security risk. But, um, you know, I, they are trying to navigate two quite different I've situations. always thought it quite interesting, and I think you make a really great point. David Cameron, Benedict. Mm created austerity. David Cameron, you could look at in terms of the immigration problems we're going through. David Cameron was the person who laid out the red carpet for the Chinese. He's now our unelected foreign secretary. I think Nick makes a really salient point, don't you? I mean, you forgot Brexit, that he then walked yeah. away from actually having Precisely. anything to do with the big one in the room, the Chinese-shaped elephant in the room. It's, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly difficult situation. Though. I mean, just listening to what was said there, in terms of sort of counter-espionage and things, what's the British state meant to do? I mean, China is not a multicultural society, actually. The, 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 the sheer issue of getting intelligence out of China becomes incredibly difficult because it's very obvious to anybody who isn't a Han Chinese who may or may not be a spy and China is very good at accruing intelligence on people who are expats mm. that's part of the reason why they're so uh, deeply ingrained in our own society but <clears throat> 
again, if we're talking about trying to isolate China, trying to sort of reshore uh, some of our economic tendencies, which I do think is a good idea, again, you have to look at what China's policy has been. The One Belt, One Road initiative is all about making sure not just that you can't isolate China, but that China is very good at isolating you because it has power over all kinds of other countries. It's not in an economic union. It is simply able to turn the screws on other countries uh, as well. So yeah, we, we got into this situation with China because we saw which way the economic wind was blowing, but now we're sort of reaping the benefits of that. When China gets nasty, it has a lot of power over you. Anthony Gleese, for now, thank you very much indeed. Our expert from Buckingham University, really appreciate that. I just want to talk politics very briefly, gentlemen. Your favourite story this morning. Gentlemen. Yes. yes. Don't assume. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. This is dementia. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Scott Benton. Yeah. By election, he resigned last night. Your neck of the woods, I gather. It is, yes, just across the border. <laughs> calm, I'm, I'm calm, Blackpool, <laughs> Blackpool, calm. I'm Blackpool North, he's Blackpool South, and I know there's been a lot of frustration locally over, obviously, what he did in terms of lobbying. Uh, for... What did he do? Can we lay it out for people? He took money, right? For, for what? Yeah, so it was a time sting. He was found to be offering uh, uh, a gambling firm's uh, sort of questions. He said he would, he would table questions, he would lobby ministers. I think he even offered to sort of leak things. So um, uh, he's since sort of denied that he was actually doing it. He said he was exaggerating what right. he was actually able to do. And, and, you know, there may well be a degree of truth in how much a backbench MP can, can do. But he was also the chair of the APPG on gambling. So there was a lot of questions being asked about his relationship with the industry even before that. And it's such an important issue, particularly in Blackpool, because it is, you know, one of these, a seaside town that I'm extremely proud to have come from and is, is a really up and coming place. It's very, very exciting. Um, because of a lot of investment that's happened in Blackpool. But on the issue of gambling, there's so many impoverished people in Blackpool who are being targeted with gambling and people who are having gambling addictions, etc. cetera. Um, and so it really was offensive to me as a local there, or formerly as a local, to think that here he is making his money off the back of making dodgy promises, false promises, which would end up anyway in potentially ruining the lives of so many people in Blackpool. And, and on a bigger scale, Benedict, and I think this is the point, um, yet another scumbag MP who's have to resign in disgrace. I don't know how many that is. And, and it further enhances what I fear, is that the British public are becoming more and more disenchanted by, by politicians and their behaviour. How many seats have they lost since they had that 80-seat majority? Oh, no, I've consigned that to, to, to my subconscious. <laughs> I don't Several. want to think about it's that. Quite it, a few, it's isn't significant. It? But, I mean, the, the thing is, though, of course, uh, he was for a seat that was previously Labour, very long-time Labour, yes. and it swung to Boris Johnson, which shows that there was already a lot of disillusion there to yeah. begin with. So this this will make people there feel a lot better um, <laughs> about their cho choice to vote Conservative. But it is going to be one of those things where, even though I think it would be expected that Labour would therefore take the seat back, because there was that level of disillusionment to begin with, I don't think it's necessarily a done deal that they absolutely storm to victory. This has to be another seat where reform have to be looking at at least getting within touching distance of the Tories. Because we've been talking, there's been a lot in the news recently about how they're, you know, outpolling the Tories when it comes to male voters, X, Y, Z. Actually, if you want to really, you know, take a chip out of the Tories, sooner or later they have to get closer, if not overtake them. We haven't seen that yet. I think this would be a seat where one would hope that that would happen if, you know, reform is going to have that kind of... Impact. Very interesting. Hate to wrap you, but thank you one and all. Really appreciate it. Kat Nealon, uh, Benedict Spencer, Anthony Gleese, thank you. Well, still to come on Talk Today, private schools brace for an exodus as a Labour plan attacks on fees. And fishy facial. Would you ever use trout sperm to stay youthful? Jennifer Aniston is apparently a fan. <laughs> well, the Mail on Sundays, Anna Mihailova and entrepreneur Hudson take us through the papers next. Stay with us. It's 8.19. Good morning. Fish sperm on your face. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 8.23. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. A new dynamic energy price caps. Dynamics being considered, which could see your costs fall during off-peak periods. That in the papers next. And now, as one oh. mother devises a test to assess her son's fiancé's suitability, we're asking, should a mother-in-law be ever present in a marriage? Mine is. Just debating that just before nine. Can't leave. And as threats to the likes of Russia and China increase, we'll ask, are we spending enough on defence? We'll discuss that with two military heavyweights. That's a bit rude. They're here at 9.15, though. But first, Naz, what's the weather looking like? It's not looking too dissimilar to yesterday and the day before that. Why didn't you just pre-record on, on Friday and then you could have had two you know days what? I off, I may mate. as well, because basically for the rest of the week, after today, it's sunshine and showers. Oh. There we go. So there you go. See you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. You're stuck with me. Let's take a look. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. No new news. Is that good news? No, because it's staying changeable. We are going to continue to see rain, showers, brisk winds and some wintry outbreaks over the next few days. It is going to become a tiny bit warmer in any sunshine as we head into the Easter weekend as the winds become lighter from around midweek. But other than that, it's staying pretty unsettled. Uh, typical spring-like conditions because it is a changeable season, spring from winter into summer. So, this morning, na uh, the name of the game is rain. <laughs> We've got rain across southern and eastern parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland, over northeast England, eastern parts of Scotland also seen some showers that are turning wintry at the moment. Everywhere else it's mostly fine and bright, but not for long. We've got another area of rain, rather persistent, spreading its way northwards up towards the eastern parts of Wales, Midlands, central, southern and eastern England this afternoon. This afternoon for Scotland, though, plenty of sunshine on the cards, but some showers turning wintry mostly across the high ground, particularly around the Aberdeenshire area. A dull afternoon for Northern Ireland, cloudy with patchy rain, and rain, as I mentioned, for the east of Wales, the Midlands, later, central, southern and eastern England, so a rather wet afternoon there. A bit of brightness developing, though, down towards the southwest of England and Wales, where it will feel mild enough in any sunshine. Temperatures up to around 12 degrees Celsius, that's around average for the time of year, below average for Scotland, though, where the cold air remains. Now, into tonight, that band of rain will be moving its way steadily northwards, up towards northern Ireland, northern England, into southern Scotland, later into central and eastern Scotland, where as it hits that colder air sitting there, it's likely to turn to snow, mainly across the high ground. 
Further south, becoming drier and clearer, but to the southwest, there will be more rain arriving. And then we continue with the rain moving its way northwards through tomorrow as well, across England and Wales, up towards Scotland later in the day. So later in the afternoon, and a bit of an improving picture from the south, but as you can see for Scotland, there will be two areas of rain, some wintry outbreaks over the high ground, so cloudy and wet for Scotland for tomorrow. Sunshine for Northern Ireland, but showers and sunshine and showers for England and Wales through tomorrow afternoon. Some of them heavy and thundery, particularly out towards the west. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Uh, Naz, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, 8.26, the Mail on Sunday's Anna... Mahailova. And entrepreneur Will... Hodson. ..are back to look through this morning's papers. Back, uh, one and all. Um, I, I, I can't tell you what we said in the break, but I can't wait to get to story five about the trout sperm. Uh, Anna, <laughs> uh, this in the Telegraph, grammar schools based for labour... Pupil surge. Yes. Um, so this is actually a very interesting way that policy that is not yet policy can already have an impact. So Labour doesn't even have to introduce its VAT on private schools. It's already having an effect. So uh, grammar schools already getting a surge of interest from parents uh, of private school children. Try and move them in in anticipation of this giant pay um, fee rise that's expected. Uh, what I really find curious here, uh, and I think it goes to the heart of the debate about this, is the reason this has come out is tutoring firms are reporting a massive surge of interest. Yep. Tutoring firms are reporting both more kids coming to them and also their fees have hugely gone up. Now, that means that it's just another way of privately educating your children. Sure. It's just another unfair. So you have to look at the Labour policy and say, right, what are you actually motivated by? Are you actually motivated by fairness? In which case, this is not going to be the way to solve the unfairness in the school system. Or are you motivated by virtue sig signalling to the base? Isn't it more about money, though? Because they're going to, you know, increase services or improve services at other state schools with this um, VAT kind of injection. Um, and you're never going to stop people from being able to, to educate your children but, through but, but, uh, tutors. But if you lose 20% of fee-paying students, sure. then the 20% uplift because of VAT is I, I don't is usually genuinely, hand on heart, talk privately too much. Um, my kids, one of my children goes to a private school. I've already had the letter saying the fees have got up by 20%. Yeah. But okay. is, it, is it right that's, that... I'm just... I'm dropping there. It's a fact. That's, yeah. that's a fact. I'm but... rather with this man. I, I, do, I do think, right, I do think that successful people... You know what I'm trying to say? I think if you choose to spend... My parents spent their money on that and they, they went without, and that is an absolute fact. That was their choice and I admire them. I do think you have to be careful to, to say to people, you work hard and you make that choice and we're going to screw you to benefit everybody else. Right. I worry about but that. But let's concept. discuss what, what, what that screwing you, uh, forgive the turn of phrase, actually involves. Because yep. what this, the current legislation says, is that basically private schools are treated as a charity. Yep. Do you think it is right that a private business, essentially, should have charitable exemptions and charitable status? Because I, I don't think it is right. Well, no. I think that if you look at the tax code, there are many, many anomalies and weird things if you really start getting to the bottom. Mm. I don't think it's about fixating about the actual tax designation. I think the actual thing is private schools, it, you know, it, it, it is going to swamp state schools. It is going to swamp grammar schools. And the people who are going to benefit most are the people who still have money and can essentially game the system, yeah. you see. I think it's, it's an interesting point, that, actually, to be fair, that, that, that people who leave, Nick, will then take over the... Play. Yeah, you can't say... I haven't thought of that. That's a good point. Fundamentally, you, I don't think you can interfere with or frustrate the most innate instinct of a parent, which is to give their child every support and advantage, frankly, that it can in life. If it's not a private school, it's going to be private tutoring. But Nicholas' point is fascinating. Why have they got this advantageous tax status sure. if, if we see them as perpetuating advantage, yeah. rather than thinking of them as being putting out educated people to our society? And something else to throw in there is, these guys are a successful, a rare case of a successful British industry. Yeah, Our true. schools are sought out internationally, and that yeah. is an advantage, having no, v having no tax. Very interesting. Well, game. Will, we're going to move on now what to a story mean? about Ofgem, a dynamic energy cap. What does so, that mean? Just cheaper? What does no, dynamic mean? Di okay. Dynamic means different prices for different times of day. And Ofgem have already trialled this. Yeah. So you can save with uh, various episodes during the year, you can save up to £20 in a session 
by moving your energy usage from peak time to off peak time. Now, why so is... freeze in the evening and have it on when you're at work. No, it's, it's a, <laughs> that people think it means I'm going to change when I watch the breakfast show. I'm going to change when I have my cup of tea after work. I can't do that. It's not that. It's because of the reality that much of our energy usage is things like charging electric vehicles, solar panels, using heat pumps, white, you know, white goods. These things can be powered far more cheaply if they are plugged in, not by you, but by a system, in the wee small hours of the morning when the wind is blowing and energy is basically free. So the incentive is give people energy as cheaply as you can. And that means dynamic pricing. Nice. Sounds good on the surface. I think it sounds brilliant, but <laughs> I, ha I suspect that energy companies will still find a way of just making more money out of people. Well, that, that's how regulation comes in. Uh, Jeremy, okay. we, shouldn't, we shouldn't just kind of glaze over for it because genuinely, energy has been cost of living, it's climate, it's industry, it's everything in this country. Now, we've got a problem in that we are hugely reliant still on gas. Yep. Gas is where most of our, you know, nearly 40% of our electricity comes from as well. Gas is how we heat our homes. They're terribly drafty. We're still as vulnerable as we used to be. We've got to do what we can to connect British consumers to the domestically generated renewable wind that we supply here Good at frack. a world-class level. Well, you could do, but you'd be going against the very clearly expressed opinions of the communities where there is some... It's kind of house building, isn't it? <laughs> but well, yeah. But fracking works in Texas, where you've got one person living in every yeah. square kilometre. It doesn't work in Lancashire, which is almost like... You London. watch Blackpool. Yellowstone. It doesn't always <laughs> work. I'd frack, it's I'd very, frack, very in, I'd frack in Blackpool North. That's where I'd frack. I'm joking. <laughs> Do you want to miss one out? You're in charge. Yes, I would, because uh, I would like to talk <laughs> Shoot to about... It, so thought. talking about... Oh, no, well, actually, do you know what? We were talking about this earlier, Same. about the increase in... Um, in uh, internet searches, I think, for, for cancer diagnoses after... Mm. Uh, uh, sorry, the Princess of Wales yeah, 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 uh, yeah. spoke about her cancer diagnosis. This story, uh, Anna, is huge fears over heart conditions as helpline calls are up 40%. Yes, where there's one decent uh, attempt to r r say something good about the NHS, there's obviously the other side as sure. well. So, um, I mean, an absolutely shocking statistic that 10, 000, more than 10,000 people are waiting, waiting more than a year for critical heart condition tests. And in 2020, in February 2020, yep. it was just 28 people. So now it's 10,000 people. Um, and the, the, the issue with the helpline is that people are waiting, they're not getting treatment, and so they're concerned. They're worried that they might have a heart attack or a stroke. Rightly so, they're concerned. Um, it's absolutely appalling. And, of course, the February 2020, while it's not spelt out in the story, is pre-COVID. Of course. And I really hope that the public inquiry, when it looks at this, it looks at this as a trade-off. Um, I don't think anyone doubts that measures, of course, had to be taken to curb a pandemic, a once-in-a-lifetime, hopefully, pandemic. But... We certainly weren't told that this would result in 10,000 plus people w waiting Same more with than a year. Same sufferers. We've done that before on the show, haven't we? People have really, really missed out. I'm not sure how much time we've got, so I want to move. It's, it's slightly uh, less, and this is right up your street, Will. Uh, Daily Mail, page nine, Lego. Have you been to Legoland? Uh, no, but I'm a very a big fan of Alton Towers. Uh, they, so. they basically, families will have to pay more on peak summer weekends than they will on rainy days as visitor numbers continue to lag behind pre-COVID levels. I'm going to just be told I'm boring. Well, that makes business sense, doesn't it? I, this is exactly the same story as we've just had on energy. Yeah. You've got loads and loads of excess supply to give away yeah. on the rainy weekdays. And there are people who are probably really desperate to get cut price mm. tickets. But at the minute, it has to be one price across the board. Mm. So this makes total sense, I think, for everyone concerned with respect to theme parks, just as it makes sense for giving people cheaper electricity. See, I think this is really unfair because it's going to end up favouring families who can afford to go at, like, at weekends um, and pay, pay that big premium. You'll, you'll end up having families maybe taking their kids out of school so that they can, you know, go on the cheaper time. Because I let you in on a secret. I want to, I'm desperate to go to Disneyland Paris. And when we're not working, it's... Me to sort it. Yes, yeah, so if you know Mick, he's got connections with the, with the Mickey Mouse Federation. I could have you on a um, float as a princess. <laughs> OK, <laughs> Just a floated you. away. <laughs> what, you're calling me a floater? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we're getting on to that in a minute. <laughs> we will do. Yes. Um, but I think it's really, really unfair that the times when I want to go and I'm able to go because of but work... But there's an easier way well, to work... But, no, but there's but an there's... easier way to work this out. I'm not a businessman, you are. Think about what we're saying. Families would have to pay more in peak 
peak summer weekends. But then when you also... When children are off. Right. So what you also do is you do early week packages. You do There's ways that you go... If you come on a Monday and Tuesday, there's family tickets. When you children are at school. No, 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 no. In the summer holidays. There, there, there are ways of and doing this. parents are at work. Some parents this. can't. I think the solution is we need more rain. There's not enough rain anymore. <laughs> Frankly, it's too I, I, sunny. I would rather, honestly, eat my own feet. I've been to Legoland many times. I used to live very near it. Appalling. But, they uh, are dreadful. I, Sorry. I, my visit to Legoland was in the early 1990s. I got a ferry over to Copenhagen with my mother and we played around in a ball pit. Oh. I was floundering at the bottom and someone stood on my face. Oh, so wow. that's my experience of Legoland. I didn't like it at all. Don't but, be a flounder in a ball pond. Always be at the surface. No From a flounder whatsoever. to... Um, well, speaking of flounders... <laughs> Uh, this is quite good, isn't it? Thank you. Do you want to read this? I just want to see your face. Anna, I, just love, I want to see Anna's face. Well, I'm going to read out the headline. I'd like to say that this is a quote, and I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> I had trout sperm jab like Jen. It's the next big fin in beauty. <laughs> Celebrities like Jennifer Aniston, Anna, talk about yep. benefits of having injections of highly purified yep. mo molecules from fish... Song Sperm. correspondent Clemmie Moody has taken one for the team and done a first-person account of getting this new fish sperm fish. injection. Just say sperm, Anna. Just, just say sperm, please. I'm not. No, she's not no, saying sperm. I'm not. Please tell me, who on earth is researching this? And do they just go around South, random... South Korea? No, no, well, it, it, it originates in South Korea, which actually probably means that it is all does work because yeah. innovations in South Korea... South Korea has invested loads in its beauty industry, which is why so many innovations have come out of this it. This is really. like what having your do? lips injected with fish sperm. Is that right? Uh, under the eyes. I mean, they say it was a brave man who first eye. ate an oyster, but the man who first tried trout sperm under his eyes to look a bit better in the morning. <laughs> I, mean, I try anything maybe, before I come maybe, on this show. But maybe not that's that. well, you've got trout sperm under your eyes. What? what? No, okay. no, it's just... It's, it's, but would you, I would you, have, with that, would you <laughs> have that injection to get full of lips? It's not for full of lips. I think it's for it more. No, it's for here. Puffy eyes. It's for here. Yeah. Well, look, I could do it. I don't mind being sweet. tested. Gross. I don't mind. I don't mind having uh, trout sperm. In the Send eyes. the samples in if they're watching. Send yeah, the yeah, yeah. In. I don't mind. You can do it live on air. I don't give a damn. I mean, that would be an amazing. <laughs> Maybe you could start by like, just rubbing caviar on it. Yeah. If you want to rub some, <laughs> yeah, seriously, some fresh row on either. No, if somebody wants to inject trout sperm in my eyes, we'll do it on it. And there's Jennifer Allison actually taking this because I often think that she's she's sort of the subject of so much speculation about various things. Jennifer Allison does this and that, and I wonder if she's ever actually admitted to it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You could say Jennifer Allison's done anything, Still and people single, would follow. Oh. Oh. Well, what's that got to do I with think anything? She's gorgeous. She, well, she's, I'll tell you why she's single. Because nobody is good enough for nobody's her. I think enough. she's an absolute queen of our hearts. Do you know what Dave just said? It's because she can smell the fish a mile away. <laughs> 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 good one, buddy. Thank you, gang. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I never thought we'd be talking about fish sperm and private school education in the same link. But oh, come on, you welcome do. Welcome to talk today. Yeah. Thank you, Anna Mihailova from The Mail on Sunday and entrepreneur. Will Hudson. Uh, you've been getting in touch with your views and your opinions. Thank you so much indeed. The main one today, obviously, that main news story about Chinese cyber attacks. Uh, are you worried? That, or should we worry as a country about interference, be it in our everyday life or in, uh, in terms of the election that's coming up? Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. Colin, if our votes are on ballot paper, that is physically counted by people, how would a cyber attack work? Well, although the vote would be counted sort of by analogue, I suppose it goes into a digital system at some point and there's concerns that that could be compromised. Shelley says, my faith in British politics has collapsed. At this point, it really doesn't matter who wins in November. It will still be the same old nonsense. A lot of that apathy we were often yeah. discussing on the show. Marilyn, the government wants to slag off China, but are we stopping massive imports of Chinese goods anytime soon? No. There you go again. That's a bit like the, the ceasefire thing we talked about earlier. Uh, America has abstained at uh, the United Nations, but they're still sending weapons. Finally, Nathan, if China did interfere with the elections, then it would be overstepping the mark and should be considered an act of war. We cannot let the Chinese casually attack our democracy, which describes the future of our nation. There you go. There are your thoughts. Or decides it, rather. Well, now, pubs across Britain are pleading... That was a bit Britain harsh, wasn't it? Pleading... Now, this, let me just explain it's to you really something about television, story. right? This oh. is very, very important, but you've just picked me up. So now the onus is on you to read this link without making a mistake. Oh, my goodness, he's Here cursed go. me now. Now, pubs across Britain are pleading for help as soaring costs are forcing them into drastic measures in order to stay afloat. Mm. One pub facing the struggle is South Yorkshire's The Old George Inn. The landlords there have had to shut their doors by 9pm most nights as there are so few customers. That was 
utterly professional. And there was a mistake in the... Uh, in Talk the today correspondent Nick Ellaby joins us now from the end. Nick, you met the landlords earlier. How do, how do locals feel about the place? That, that uh, you know, this nine o'clock closure because of costs, I mean, that's the central hub of the local community, the pub in the old days, definitely. Absolutely, Jeremy. Good morning and good morning to Nick as well. Yes, it, these pubs, especially, as you say, where we are in Syke House, uh, in Yorkshire, we're kind of in between Leeds and York and Scunthorpe and Doncaster. You know, places like this, you have to drive quite a long way to find a pub. So they're such important hubs for local communities, for people to meet, to make friends, you know, and network as well. Uh, we've been speaking to the owners here, Rosie. Rosie's here behind the bar at, at the, today, and she's telling how tough it is actually, she said on Wednesday, I think they'd only sold one lime and soda by about six o'clock, and that was the auntie of one of the staff members. So pubs like this are having to close early, sometimes eight or nine o'clock, uh, just to save on costs. It cost them 250 pounds just to open. If they're not getting that money back, then, you know, it's, it's just causing, causing huge stress and leading to places like this closing down. The British Beer and, Beer and Pub Association said that over 300 pubs closed last year, possibly another 700 by June. So this is developing into a national tragedy. But we're speaking to people here in the Old George in Syke House about how important this place is. And here's what the locals told us about this, this hub and this community hub. So I generally think this is the best thing ever to have happened to the village. Um, we've been here about seven years, um, but we didn't actually, we didn't know anyone in the village. Um, I worked all over the world, my husband worked in Cheshire. We meet here about once a fortnight on a Wednesday morning, not a Sunday, and have what we call cafe church. I don't know where we'd meet, you know, maybe the village hall, but it's so nice coming here. It's, it's a lovely atmosphere. No, I, I think it would be such a shame if we can't come here. So customers here telling us that, you know, if this place closed down, they don't know where they'd go. We met some ladies from a sewing club that have been in here and also because the local church, the heating's not working. So they're hosting evenings here as well. So it's so important for the community. We're going to meet a couple of regulars just around the corner, a lovely building here in the Old George. Um, we've got yeah, a few of them here in the naughty corner, as you can see where they like to, to sit. We've got David, Dodge and Sam as well. David, just tell us a little bit about this place and, and how important it is to you and your family. Uh, it's very important. We moved here 10 years ago nearly and we were never considered pub people. But now we're in here several times a week because of the, the friendships that have been built and the community atmosphere in here. It would be devastating if we lost it now as a focal point for the village. OK, thanks, Todd. I mean, com companies like this calling out for a bit more help. We spoke to John, the owner, this morning, who'd like a bit more help off VAT. The government is saying, look, they have offered 75% discount on business rates, frozen alcohol duty, but pubs like this are asking for a bit more help. And this business is now diversifying to get more uh, mill business in. You've got uh, biker nights here, that kind of thing, as well as uh, film festivals over the summer. Um, Sam, just tell us a bit about what goes on here and what kind of crowds that draws in. Well, one of the things that Rosie and John have really tried to do is diversify. So we've now got a book club here. There are um, obviously the biker nights and we've got on in May, we've got a, a sci-fi day for the first time. And yes, they're sponsoring uh, my very first film fest here as well. And we also do Doctor Who days and bring writers in. So we're trying, you know, everybody's trying really hard to make sure that this, this wonderful pub survives. And how would you feel if it, if it went bust? I'd be absolutely devastated because, you know, this is the heart of the community. When, when we started coming in here, we found friendship, we found wonderful food, but best of all, the company. I mean, what more could you want? Okay, I mean, you heard it here, like, you know, people just crying out for places like this to stay open. Uh, Dodge, just, just very quickly, what would you do if this place closed? It'd be like going back in time to COVID. It'd be horrendous. Horrendous. All right. OK, well, no one wants to go back to that. So fingers crossed the government can help and places like this can keep diversifying. Guys. Good man, Nick. Nick Ellaby in South Yorkshire as he continues to traverse the United Kingdom. Good man. Still to come and talk today. Here's a question for you. Should a mother-in-law ever get overly involved in their son's marriage or do they need to learn when to butt out? My mother-in-law, I can't get her out of the house. We'll be debating that next as we talk today. We're coming back.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. What is it? Uh, 12 minutes to 9 o'clock. Now, a woman was left dumbfounded, my friends, after her partner's mother asked her to take a suitability test to determine whether or not she'd be a good fit for a beloved son. So, this morning, we're asking, should a mother ever get overly involved in their children's relationships? Or do they need to learn when to mind their own business? Joining us to this debate is broadcaster Lizzie Cundy, who believes that no one, absolutely no one, is good enough for her sons, which is why they don't talk to her. And mothers <laughs> should have some say in their children's marriage. Meanwhile, dating expert Jamie Johnston thinks that devising a test totally undermines your son's ability to pick a partner. Welcome, both of you. Lizzie, you think it is OK to get really involved with your son's relationships. Why? Yes, I do. I really do. Well, I've got two wonderful boys. I'm blessed with two wonderful boys. And they're my mm. world. So I want them to be happy. I want them to have the right girl. And luckily, my eldest boy has found the most wonderful, kindest girl you could ever wish for. And we get on really well, which I'm really you know, Now, I happen about. to know a lot about you, Cundy, which is why that is a <laughs> load of done. old tosh, isn't it? Because let's be honest, yeah. right? When you got together with your man... Yes. What did your mother say to you? She actually said, I can't believe you're going out with a footballer. I hope for And a you doctor. didn't listen to her. No, I didn't. But what I did do... <laughs> That's the danger, isn't it, no, is what I'm saying, no, right? No, no, but listen, when I met Jason... Um, I realised that his own mother had a huge part in his life. Right. And for us to get on, uh, I, you know, I had to really get friendly with her. Yeah. Uh, so much so, she was actually at the birth of my child. She was actually there. So, you know, you have to realise mother, mother-in-laws are very important. They are, but, Jamie, surely the point is, am I not right in saying that boys might go, my mother's not getting involved, I'm out of here? 
Well, I, th I think, you know, mothers can be involved for sure, but devising a test of uh, suitability which had cooking, cleaning and all these sorts of things on it to, to devise if that's a good partner for your son, I think is a bit OTT and undermines your son's ability to pick his own partner because essentially he's picking the partner for himself, not for the mother. Right? Not only is it undermining his autonomy, but yeah. also it's a bit misogynistic, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, totally. Well, no, I, I, look, I wouldn't say to my son, look, my youngest is single, and I won't say to his new potential girlfriends, you know, do this test, can they cook, and, you know, all of mm. that stuff. But you want them to be kind, and yeah. you know what's right for your son. The, the line yes. between advice, right, and, and feeling as a mother, but there is something very unique about um, the mother and the son as there is between <laughs> father and daughter. So I'm here to tell you this. My daughters will not even ever let any of their boyfriends ever meet me. She said to me, can you imagine? This is my dad, Jeremy Carl, but it's going to run off down the Actually, bleeding yeah. road, which I really care. I mean, I get that completely. I totally understand yeah. that. And I feel for my boys having me as their mother. I mean, can you imagine? And I, I think I can be a bit daunting at times for the for the future, you know, yeah. girlfriends. But, you know, you care and you know the best yeah, for your son yeah, yeah. and you know what works and doesn't work. Mum knows that, best and all yeah. that, right? Jamie, do you think we're raising a generation of mummy's boys, though. Yeah. There's, a, there's a fine line, isn't there, between having a good, healthy relationship with your mother and then cutting the umbilical cord and moving on and leading your own life. Oh, I know where this is going. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, God, I feel like I'm under pressure here. Uh, and don't you think, do you think that if, if men have a relationship with a mother that's too codependent, they then expect their next partner to become not just a partner, but a mother? Of course, yeah, to totally nail on the head there. If if they haven't done anything their whole lives in terms of cooking, cleaning, chores, all that kind of stuff, they go out into the world expecting that from, from their partner. Sure. And the worlds have moved on dramatically since, you know, it was the norm to have a stay-at-home mum. You know, now, you know, double income is really, really important. We're talking about cost of living and all that kind of stuff. So it's good uh, to, to teach these things to your, to your son and uh, get them out there picking a partner that can, you know, do stuff together See, with I'm them. See, I'm old-fashioned. I don't think you pick them. a partner. I think... <laughs> let me throw this for all of you. What Susie, you? I'm... No, I don't, it happens, doesn't it? All this... I and mean, then I'm old-fashioned. You yeah. go online and, oh, he fits or she fits. And also, my boys are big boys, but they're also still my babies. <laughs> right. Uh, so, I don't know about big they are. Susie... I'm a mother-in-law. My four sons had no interest in my choosing their wives. And I'm glad your daughter is your daughter for life. Your son is your son until he finds a wife. I love my sons, I love my daughters-in-law, and I love my loving grandchildren. Lizzie, I've got to ask. Yes. Would you ever set an ultimatum for your sons if there was something that you and their partner disagreed on? Would you ever say to them, it's me or your other half? Uh, possibly, yes. I, I could say, if it was something really, really, like, drastic mm -hmm. and I was worried for them or worried for their yeah. health. Yeah. Look, my boys are my world. I'll yeah. do anything for them. As Isn't that mother. the interesting thing about parenting, though, Nick, as well? Because, you know, with kids, they say you've got to allow them to make mistakes. But the... the, the, the my the... kid is three months old. She no, no, hasn't but, made that many no, mistakes No, but do you know yet. what I'm saying? And you, as a parent, you want to say, don't do that, but you have to step back and let that happen. Exactly. And look, and how many times have I had a boyfriend and afterwards, you know, my mum would say, I told you, I never liked him. Yeah. And I didn't listen. And, I, I, and mums, and I think mums and sons have got very special They do indeed. Well, let's flip it on its head. Would you accept your son's advice on your partner? Oh, oh. <laughs> would, no. Would, you, would a partner for you... Look at the face. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Would they have no, to pass the test from your son? I have to say, this did happen. I was seeing someone which they both couldn't bear, and they actually said, Mum, if you, you don't stop seeing him, we, we would did literally... You? Not, did you? listen? And I did listen. Did and they were okay. right, because they want the best for me as I do for them. Well, I, yeah, my mother and I can't get her out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's yeah. often in my house looking after my little girl. Yeah, we love that. We love that. Yes, and we're we very it. handy, and I can't wait to be a grandma. But <laughs> yeah. I have to say, and this will go down like a lead balloon, my mother's no longer with us, but there's nobody still. You know, there still will be a moment in my life where I'd ring my mother and ask for advice if she was still alive. And really quickly, Jamie, yep. uh, does your mother give you dating advice? Oh. You're a dating expert. Uh, yeah, she does, but it's it's advice and it's done conversationally, like, you know, and it's more about not what they can do with, with cooking and cleaning, all that stuff, but who they are as people, and I think that's the most important thing. Here, here. Well, thank you so much, Lizzie Cundy and Jamie Johnston. What a great discussion. Well, still to come. As Grant Shapps prepares to answer questions on what we spend on our armed forces, we'll ask two military experts if more money is needed to get the most out of our military. Can you go and get me a cup of tea in the How kitchen? Yeah, you. <laughs> this is Talk Today. It is five to nine. Wow. Well, yeah.
Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's just before nine o'clock on Tuesday, the 26th of March. Yes, it is. And you were talking today on TV, on radio, of course, online, and your smart speaker. These are Tuesday morning's top stories. Sanctions over the China hack. Two individuals and one business are blamed over the 2021 data breach. The Deputy Prime Minister says we must defend our precious democracy. But rebels say the government's actions don't go far enough. A step towards peace. The US abstains as the UN resolution on the ceasefire in Gaza finally passes. It comes as Benjamin Netanyahu cancels meetings uh, between Israel and the US. And Grant Shapps faces questions from the Defence Committee on spending this afternoon. So, are we giving enough to our armed forces? We'll debate that this hour. And it's another typical spring-like day, sunshine for some, but showers or rain for others with some wintry outbreaks too. Whoops. <laughs> I'll have the details later. <laughs> Cheers, That's all about. Well, now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Starting with our breaking news story, a major bridge has collapsed in the US city of Baltimore after it was hit by a cargo ship. A major incident's been declared and footage shows a large section of the 1.6-mile-long Francis Scott Key Bridge falling into the water following the collision at around 1.30 a.m. local time. 
Well, Baltimore City Fire Department say up to 20 people and several vehicles have fallen into the river. The ship is registered in Singapore and was reportedly on its way to Colombo in Sri Lanka. Well, live footage shows the large multi-agency rescue and recovery operation which is underway right now. Local officials have called the incident a developing mass casualty event. And we'll bring you more on this breaking story as we get it. Here and the government's today being criticised for not going far enough to combat the cyber threat posed by China. Two people and a company have now been sanctioned over potential attacks, which the Chinese embassy in the UK says is completely unfounded. Well, several MPs say the government's not holding China to account and that the response is insufficient, given the severity of the situation. Next, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It marks a significant shift in the position of the United States on the issue after the country decided not to veto the measure. It's the first time the organization as a whole has called for an end to the fighting since the war began in October. Well, former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth has told Talk Today the protests that have been sparked as a result have caused more harm than good. I don't think the protests have had the slightest influence on the British government. Uh, I cannot speak for the United States government, but I do not think they've had any influence here. I think, if anything, they have uh, uh, upset a lot of British people. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, I just do not go to London. And my friends and I do not want to go to London on, on a Saturday. Our capital city has been taken over. Well, this comes as the UK's airdropped food supplies into Gaza for the first time. The Royal Air Force parachuted more than 10 tonnes of aid, including water, rice, cooking oil, flour, tinned goods and baby formula to civilians. Meanwhile, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has urged Israel to allow more aid into the war-torn territory. And more than 2,000 suspected banking copycat websites were reported last year, according to new research. The consumer group Witch is calling for new legal duties to force domain registrars to do more to prevent these scams. Copycat banking websites masquerade as real banks to try and trick people into handing over their personal details and cash. You're up to date with the headlines. I'll have another update at 10 o'clock. And thank you. Loads thank of you, serious Mary. stuff there. But what's happened to the Australian that was stuck underground for 36 hours? That's the big story of the day. Yes. <laughs> Your favourite story, isn't it? It is indeed. There was a story uh, earlier today, Emily wasn't there, about an Australian man who dropped his phone down a drain. Yes, yeah. so he went to try and get it and ended up trapped for 36 Come hours. Come from a worm down under. <laughs> I've done it twice now. There you go. Thanks, Em. Thank you, Emily. Lots to cram into this hour. Keep uh, keep sending your messages. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8732. You want to talk about the, uh, well, the cyber security threat. Something else as well. We were talking about Labour's plan to add VAT to private school education. What do you think about that? A couple of responses, Nick. Yes, indeed. John from Lincolnshire texted us his views to 8722. He said that the VAT on schools may backfire. For instance, private schools will now be able to claim back VAT on items they need to buy for the business. The government is not going to receive a net 20% on fees. Richard says the Labour Party imposing VAT on private schools is morally wrong. It's like using children's education struggling parents for political gain. Appalling. And Mark texted us as well. He said, here the Labour Party comes with an attack on private schools whilst having no clue about its impact. Very interesting indeed. Keep your messages coming. Our top story, let's go back to it. This is incredible to me. After three years and 40 million people being hacked, two people and a company were yesterday sanctioned over Chinese cyber attacks on the UK. In a pretty dour speech yesterday, Deputy PM Oliver... Dowden, uh, said Beijing was behind the attacks on the voter register and on a number of MPs. Well, joining us now Hurrah! is parliamentary sketch writer Quentin Letts. Morning, girls. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you, boss? Quentin. Well. I want to know, yes. how what do you concerned know? are you about the threat of China? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought maybe not. What a palaver yesterday. Oliver Dowden stands up. He's about as threatening as a, as a washer-upper. I uh, mean, you know, he's all wet hands, with his, waving his marigolds around the place. And uh, he's deputy prime minister, this man. He's got no presence. He's he? just so feeble. Anyway, uh, he, he stood up and sort of um, uh, squeaked away for a bit. And then the MPs are all absolutely furious. This is disgraceful. But the, 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 the MPs particularly cross are those who've been hacked themselves. Ian Duncan Smith. Um, Tim Loughton, who's a Tory backbencher, and uh, uh, Scott Snap called somebody somebody, and uh, uh, Stuart McDonald, that's right, 
Uh, there are two of those. And, well, Duncan, um, I've got to give this to you. Duncan Smith <laughs> said the UK's response was like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Yes, And, and I'm not, I would never actually. really agree with the Make SMB. me think of you. McDonald accused ministers of turning up <laughs> yeah. at a gunfight with a wooden spoon. Yeah, but... They've but, been reading your columns. But the trouble is that, you know, that, that these wicked Chinese, uh, allegedly wicked Chinese, they've been going into the Electoral Commission and getting all our details. They could just buy a telephone book. I this mean, is it, what I was saying not, earlier. It's not. And, and also, uh, the minister, wet old Dowden, said that actually the, the, the hacking didn't work. So we're all getting absolutely furious about um, something that didn't work. I mean, the Chinese must be wetting themselves with laughter. Meanwhile, <laughs> we're all, you know, there's millions of people in, in the UK who are downloading TikTok. Yeah, well, if and you leaving... want to, I don't. I don't know how to do it. But leaving that kind of data <laughs> open to potentially being abused. America's trying to ban it because they say yeah. that's Chinese-owned and people, on a serious note, are saying that these people... We are now talking about cyber security. Yeah. That's the Cold War. That's how these people are infiltrating. It's different from the old days. I mean, I'm a bit like... I don't understand a lot of it, but you'd have to be concerned, wouldn't you? Uh, well, I, must I be concerned? I mean, if, if they are going to put the, um, the, the codes for our nuclear weapons, half of which don't work. Uh, uh, if they're going to put those on, uh, on their, their Hotmail account, <laughs> then I can see that might be a bit unwise. But presumably they have slightly more sophisticated... Presumably. Uh, presumably. <laughs> but are they trying to control people's minds? Well, in that case, uh, we are really lost. If we can't uh, think for ourselves against uh, communist China, uh, I mean, the, the one thing we've got going for us in the West, which got masses of things, the West is a brilliant place, but the, the, the real thing that we've got is our freedom yeah. and uh, the, the freedom of thought. And we still have that. Look, I mean, the internet is, is fantastically we, free place. It, and the Chinese cannot fight that. They will never win. They will never suppress the Having internet. said that, the company ByteDance owns TikTok. Yes. And I believe it's banned in China and, and certainly a lot of the... No, sorry, some of the content that they put out in China is very much uh, about working hard yeah. and leading a good, disciplined life. Whereas the content over in the West is about, one of our guests said earlier, um, how many crates, you, milk crates you can jump over and really quite idiotic stuff. So China, if they were to manipulate some of the algorithms of what people see, they could certainly sway cultural opinion. Yeah, but the, you're supposing there that middle-class Chinese don't have VPNs, which are these devices where they can get round the blocking mm -hmm. uh, of the state. I mean, I, I've got a Chinese daughter-in-law. I, I better not get her into trouble. Don't get her into trouble. But I can tell you that I have heard of uh, middle-class Chinese who are all looking at Western websites and all fully clued up as mm. to what's going on here. But they have to pretend to be cowed by the Chinese government. Suppression of thought. Speaking, never works. Speaking Very of interesting. to democracy, um, we have a by-election in Blackpool South. Oh, on Benty its way. Benton. Uh, <laughs> sleaze. Sleaze is such a threat to our democracy at the moment, don't you think? Uh, no. No? Because he got outed, didn't he? I mean, the Times found him out. So what's the problem? But that's the, yes. I mean, you know, actually, well, he, was quite, he was quite good in the Commons, Benton. Uh, he was an unusual voice. He was very politically incorrect. But I like that. You know, he was challenging the, the orthodoxy. And um, he, he? he spoke up for his... He, well, yeah, he, he, he said he spoke up for um, very traditional views. Yes. Yeah, he didn't get him very far. And uh, then he got caught... Um, Surely that's championing the orthodoxy. If he's, if he's defending uh, traditional views. No, well, no, traditional views are not the orthodoxy, are they? I see. <laughs> Come on, you must realise that. <laughs> I love the liberal listening. elite. I love listening to mm. you The liberal too. elite is... What it tradition. does do, what it does do, and I've said, and I think you'd agree, is it further, in my mind, says to the British public, we get ourselves out of this Westminster bubble, a lot of people, north and south, are looking at the behaviour of MPs, Quentin, and just going, I am not investing in this anymore. And my fear, because I believe in a democracy, you talk about free speech and all that, is the people, I don't care what anybody says to me, will turn out less and less when more Scott Bentons happen on a regular basis, whatever side of the political fence they come from. I think there'll be a very low turnout yeah, at I agree, the next general election, but I don't actually think it's got to do with little Scott Benton uh, um, being naughty. Yeah. I think it's got to do with the politicians being dull. But well, having no it's, ideas. It's not just little Scott Benton being naughty. There's been an awful lot of people who've been very, very naughty over the. <laughs> Sorry, I, I go. <laughs> yeah, but I just, All right, miss. I just thought, uh, yeah, but, but, yeah, I go but, quite... but the, the yeah. fact that they've been found out shows that our system is pretty good yeah. at that.
We okay. could, uh, you know, our media is terrifically efficient. But what? <laughs> getting hold it's of this. Best parliamentary skip rider. We haven't got much time. Do you want to go to this because you'll know about this because he lives in Herefordshire. What's that? Then? Talk to me about farmers protesting outside Parliament. Gosh, they were noisy last night. Mm. But you know, completely pointless protest. I'm afraid, chaps, because they go round. They went round and round uh, Parliament Square, uh, letting off their hooters. The only people who could hear them were the policemen on the gates and those of us, the journalists, who have um, windows overlooking. New Palace Yard. Mm -hmm. The MPs all have soundproofed offices. <laughs> so the people they were trying to get uh, didn't hear. But I must say, I then walked down uh, Whitehall, and it was uh, they're terrific. I love seeing tractors. Uh, they were very expensive tractors. <laughs> the idea that farmers have no money. <clears throat> uh, the price of some of those. You're tractors. on one today. Anyway, you are. then I saw amid all these tractors, there, yes. was, there was a van with vegan protesters. Oh, God. And they were all dressed as root vegetables. They were dressed up as carrots. Is that going in the next column? No, I just thought it was a great moment. Uh, they, they, they were supporting the farmers. Just you know. very, very quickly, trout sperm can improve. This is a big story today. Trout, trout sperm. 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 Oh, sperm. Oh, yeah. Injected, it can improve your... your what's it called? Complexion. Puffy eyes. Do I need my infection? No, I just infection. wonder what you thought about it. Jennifer Aniston's use it. Do you think several MPs could do with having I their faces I'd keep, injected? I keep well away from it. Is that, that what that, that model Jordan has been up to? What's she called? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure we wouldn't want to. Well, I, think she's a Casey Price. I think she's had a whole, whole sort of sturgeon farm full of it. <laughs> <laughs> my oh, goodness. God, we love you. Quentin Letts, legendary right, as ever. You. Thanks uh, for being What day does the column go in? Which column? Every day I have to do a blasted column. Oh, my goodness. Again, not over Easter. I'm, I'm stopping over Easter. Are you going home? Yes. Holy devotions. Love Devotions. Oh. That's what we love. Recess and holy devotions. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> so much, that. Quentin Letts, for joining us this morning. Still, I always feel so cheeky when Quentin's on. I know you've told um, us both off know, like I we're have. young boys. Naughty, naughty boys. Right, Royal Britannia <laughs> or broke Britannia? Should the UK up its defence spending? We're discussing that with some military heavyweights next. This is Talk Today. It is 12 minutes past nine. Stay with us. Yes, miss. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss <it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk Today, quarter past nine. Now, later on today, Grant Shapps will face questions from the Defence Committee over funding for the armed forces. Well, the hearing comes <clears throat> as the Defence Secretary delivered warnings that the UK is moving from a post-war to a pre-war world amid rising threats from Russia and China. Well, to tell us more on this is military analyst Sean Bell, who believes we should absolutely spend more on defence, adding that it's essential for our protection. Meanwhile, former NATO commander Chris Parry reckons that we currently invest enough and it's an allocation issue instead. Sean, let's start with you. Why do we need more money for our military? Good morning. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Nicola. Um, I'm not so sure it's about more money. I think it's about um, at the end of the Cold War, we were spending 4% on defence. Peace dividend, we now spend 2% on defence. And yet it starts to feel like a rather more dangerous world. Grant Shapps is saying it's more dangerous. Um, one of the things that we have in the next 10 years particularly is we're replacing a lot of our nuclear uh, capability. That capital spend, 41 billion, is coming out of the defence budget as well. That will leave uh, fewer pounds available to spend on defence. And the third point is that the way of war by the West, we tend to use technology, precision strike, because we don't like to just throw bodies at the fight the way the Russians do. And the danger is that high tech precision fighting costs money. We need to invest in it. We've been shown to have very limited war stops. And therefore, given that defence is an insurance policy against an uncertain world, it feels like 2% doesn't feel like enough, given the uh, the challenges around us at the moment. Sean, completely agree. Uh, Parry, come on, my lad. I agree with everything you usually say. You've, you've been going on for months at me about this axis of Russia and China and Iran and how the world has changed. 2.6%. We need, I know there's a cost of living crisis, but the world has changed. We've talked about cyber security. We need to up our game, don't we, Chris, on a serious note? Yeah, we do, Jeremy. But if you give the Ministry of Defence money now, they'll waste it. Uh, Sean knows as well as I do that if you uh, want to build our defence forces up to what they need to be, it needs to be a five to 10 year transformation. If I gave you um, 10 million tomorrow, uh, for producing additional artillery shells, for example, we simply can't do it because our industry isn't geared up for it. So rather than, rather like giving somebody a drink, a pint, if you like, having been sort of thirsty in the desert for a week, you'll kill him. It's the same with the Ministry of Defence. The fact of life is, uh, in accordance with the integrated review of 2019, uh, we've got enough money. It's just badly allocated right now. Uh, but what we do need to have is a five, 10 year plan, which is properly costed, which says, look, at some stage, we're going to have to take on Russia and China. If that's the case, this is what it costs. Uh, and one thing we've been very clear about, uh, you, Rosie and me, and that is the fact, uh, you know, that if, if you don't deter enough, uh, you're going to find yourself fighting right now. If I'm on the other side, I'm thinking, you know what? I can see the bottom of their locker. I might take them on sometime soon. Sean, just taking that point up from Chris, and I'm, I'm really interested in this debate, and I mean this, enough money badly allocated, he says. Your response to that? Well, there's a lot that Chris and I will agree on. Uh, having worked in the Ministry of Defence, um, there are successive reviews that suggest that the money could be better spent. I have no doubt um, that is true. I also think that um, if you look at the uh, our two, just over 2%, Defense, GDP on defence spending, only 11 of the 32 NATO countries do that. I think we should be putting more pressure on the other 21 to step up to the plate, given that NATO is part of our security umbrella. The challenge, though, I think is ultimately it, you get what bang for your buck do you get? I agree with Chris that we need to be smarter how we spend it. But I do. And also, I'm a taxpayer like you in this country, and we've got lots of difficult priorities. I'm not suggesting for one minute that we should suddenly double the defence spending. But Grant Shapps, our defence secretary, has said it's a more dangerous world, yet the government prioritised tax cuts and childcare over defence. That just doesn't feel quite right in the, today's atmosphere. And Chris, we saw yesterday the government officially blaming China for that, um, that data hack. Um, but what if China or Russia, any of our, you know, potential enemies, were to actually not just go about data mining here in the UK, but enforce a malicious attack on the United Kingdom? Do we have the correct cyber infrastructure in order to be able to defend ourselves against such an attack? Well, it depends who you mean by us, uh, Rosie, really, whether you mean the military or indeed the civilian infrastructure. The fact of life is uh, any country, any 
body with a, a large number of trained geeks can take on any country to tell you the truth and collapse its infrastructure. I mean, one of the things I've been looking at recently is our space infrastructure, the United States and ours. It's wide open to cyber attack uh, and uh, we've been very complacent. Uh, what really worries me about all this is that, um, you know, I, I just get the impression politicians get worried about all these things just before an election. People like Sean and I have been saying this for 10 years. You've been hearing me bang on about the, the threat from China, Russia and Iran. And now suddenly in an election year, it's important. So but it they, feels like it, electioneering, basically. Well, th this is the point, though, isn't it? That, that, that Of course, and, and we know, don't we, that a stronger military and more spending will appeal to a Tory base. We know that. But I want to take your point about it's a, a strategic plan over 10 years, presumably, gentlemen, as military people... That's where the frustration of our political system comes in, because you'll get five years and a change, presumably, and five years and a change. Presumably, it's a bit like the NHS that needs to cut cross-party involvement to make sure that something happens across a sustained period of time. Would you agree with that, Sean? Well, I'm very proud of Adam Oxford. Chris and I served, and um, we watched a lot of colleagues give up their lives to preserve our democracy. It has its weaknesses. I think Churchill famously described it as the least worst option of governing. One of the challenges, though, uh, as highlighted at the moment, is that the, the uh, government has actually recognised that there's an increasing threat, more money should be spent, but it's not going to have a defence review until the general election. And, of course, whoever gets in afterwards, they're not going to have a defence review and in time, but the results of that won't be for a, about a year after that. So we've got two years where we're going to be muddling on at a time when it feels that Russia is feeling emboldened. It's looking like it's pushing back Ukraine. China will un um, learn its own lessons from what's going on. And it doesn't feel the time where we can be treading water. It feels like the time where we should be pushing pushing ahead. And that, that is a worry about one of the weaknesses of our political system. And Sean, do you think things will be different under Labour? Well, I, I try to get, avoid getting involved in uh, in politics in these sorts of conversations. I've been engaging with quite a lot of cross-party folks to do some influencing around the peace, and I think they're just as concerned as anybody as to the uh, the concerns of the future. But the harsh reality was it vision without funding is hallucination, and unless you've got money, it's very difficult to spend it on. If you spend more on defence. Where do you take it from? And that, unfortunately, is a line that any government is going to struggle with over the next few years. Uh, it's interesting, just to finish as well, um, um, Chris and both of you, so grateful to have you on. I, I just feel like there is an acknowledgement now, whether it's the cyber security uh, nonsense yesterday, and that was three years, by the way, or we look at the Middle East, or we look at Ukraine. I used to be called, you know, you're warmongering. I don't think we are accused of that now, because I think the world briefly, is in, a, is in a far more volatile place. And that's why people will call for greater investment and a change. Would you agree with that briefly, Chris? Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, look, we're in 1937 at the moment. Our politicians then, after a decade of appeasement, suddenly realised something was up and we started rearming again. Uh, and Sean's right, you know, we, we've got to start saying to our politicians, what outcomes do you want? Because that's not what they're saying at the moment. Everybody says, oh, let's have a bigger army. But nobody can tell you why we need a bigger army. It's lessons like that that have to be dealt with. But the fact of life is, uh, as we've seen with our European allies, I mean, Germany, with its huge GDP, spends barely more than 1.3%. Oh, I cut you of off GDP. there. You I hate to cut you both off because you are my okay. favourite guest. Sean Bell, uh, former NATO commander Chris Parry, thank you very, very much indeed. That is all we have time for today. We'll see you tomorrow at 6. Kevin and Alex are up next at first. Here's the weather with Naz. Off to get that trout. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Rain for some, sunshine for others this afternoon. I think we're going to see most of the rain across parts of Northern England, Ireland and Northern Ireland eventually heading towards Scotland. But there's another batch of wet weather also spreading northwards across the east of Wales, the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England for this afternoon. But to the southwest of England, a bit of brightness where it will feel reasonably mild and also some sunshine to be had across parts of northeast England and for central northern parts of Scotland. But Scotland is feeling cold with the cold airflow sitting there. Now, overnight, 
tonight. We'll continue to see that rain across England and Wales spread further northwards up towards uh, Northern Ireland, Northern England and central and southern Scotland. As it hits the cold air there, there's some snow likely across the highlands and towards eastern parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, further south will become drier and clearer, but yet more wet weather will head to the southwest by dawn. And then through tomorrow, we do it all again. Rain continues to move northwards across Scotland with some hill snow there and more rain spreading northwards across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. In between, there will be a bit of brightness for eastern England at first and then later for Wales and the West Country. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, 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 treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism in it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now 